I'm Claire Parker. And I'm Ashley Hamilton. And this is Celebrity Memoir Book Club, the podcast where we will read apparently literally anything you guys ask us to. But in return, the payment is our opinions. And so if you don't want to sit down and read 1,000 pages of Barbara Streisand's life and you want to hear what we have to say about it, well, then you must actually want to hear what we have to say about it. And if you don't, stop listening. I couldn't have said it better myself, even if I was given a thousand pages to do it. <laughs> Can I tell you guys something before we get you into tell it? tell me anything. I don't know about them, but I give you permission forever. We've got new merch coming out. Shut up. Is that true? It's so true. That's crazy. Just in time for a holiday, maybe? I know. I think it would be actually like the best gift ever to get for someone who might be a squirmy little worm in the sand. What? The stry sand. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Claire. Yes. What else could people look forward to? The Winter Spectacular. Okay. I assume Friday is fully sold out by now, but the good news is we're only doing a meet and greet after the Thursday show. So if you haven't bought your tickets yet, there are still tickets available to the Thursday night showing. This is going to be a twice in a lifetime experience. We are getting props. We are getting costumes. We are writing a fucking play and performing (laughs) it ourselves. We have musical guests. We have speaking guests. We have silent guests. We have ghost guests. No, I don't know. No, I actually do think so. Yeah. Based on the spirits in the room. I don't know who's coming. I can't control them. They don't have to buy tickets. They can walk through a wall. It is going to be so fun. So spectacular. Think about the Rockettes and now add the fun laughs of Elf and now add the wonder of Christmas. What if Rockettes couldn't dance? And so they had to rely on their personalities. That's something I bet you'd like to see. (laughs) But it's going to be so fun. We're only doing the meet and greet Thursday. So fear not if you think, oh, no, I didn't get the Friday night one. First of all, it's the holidays. Nobody should really be working anyway. You know, after Black Friday, you turn your computer off and you say, I'll see you in the new year. Totally. Speaking of the new year, in January, we're going to go to Phoenix on January 18th and L.A. on January 19th. And there's going to be some more stuff coming, too. Also, we still have tour exclusive merch. So if you are like, I don't even like these bitches, but I am looking for a cute pair of athletic socks. Yeah. It's worth the price of admission just to then be able to pay the price of a sock. That's so true. Well, I can't wait to see you guys soon. Claire, if you were writing a memoir about your life, how would you title last week's chapter? Okay. It would actually not be a title. It would be the song that Fiona Apple wrote for the show, The Affair, which is a song that I thought was a real song. And I once spent an hour online trying to find the whole thing before realizing that it was like a custom song that was only an intro. Dang. But it's really good. She's like, sink back into the ocean. That's me this week. You sunk in the ocean? The way that a wave comes up and laps and kisses the shore. Good morning. I was said, I'm coming up, baby. We had a great couple of weeks. We did some great shows on the road. We filmed our new project that we're so excited to debut in the new year. I went to a wedding, had tons of fun. So many people I know have babies now, and it's just been really beautiful to see everybody's little hearts expand, 10 sizes like the Grinch. Yeah, that's so true. It's so cute to see people's like capacity for love when there's a little baby with tiny hands. I feel good. I'm excited about life. Babies are so cute. I got so much sleep over Thanksgiving. I was feeling like refreshed, refurbished, ready to hit the goddamn ground running. And then I was whacked in the back of the head with a brick, metaphorically. And that was this book. And I have to say, Barbara, Babs, Babby girl, (laughs) you took me down. (laughs) I felt so good. And like we have four weeks of like a good amount of stuff we got to tackle. We got a lot going on, baby. And then I have a little Christmas break. Four weeks, just a quick little sprint to finish up the year strong. Oh, boy. I didn't know that this was like a steeple race where I started just limping. <laughs> what happens in a steeple race? Right? There's like a pond you have to swim through. There's obstacles. You have to jump over things. I was feeling good 72 hours ago. And now I'm feeling, if you are watching the YouTube video, I've never looked worse. <laughs> and that's saying something. I think you look nice. That's literally the meanest thing you can say to me right now. So I hope you take it back. I like your hair like that. Anyway, Ashley, if you were a celebrity and you were going to write a memoir, what would last week's title be? Oh, it would be called Speaking of Those Little Babies. Okay. I. It would be like a reference to my memoir. <laughs> to flip over to Ashley's. No, I was going to speak of little babies anyway. I was just segueing from your chapter. I would call my chapter, Oh, Those Tiny Hands. If you guys have been following on my journey, I was not a baby person and I slowly started warming up to them. And now I have a niece baby who I feel like she's taken my fear of baby holding away. What were you afraid it was going to happen? 
As they tumble, they stumble. No, you hold them. I'm not a good holder. I don't know. They're so fragile and they're so little. And then I was like, mm, no, they're people. They're the least fragile of us all. They're made yeah. of like rubber bands that you could bounce them no problem. And I feel like I've only known pretty uptight parents when I've met like a little baby. I've only met a couple babies like under two months. And I feel like I've met people who are like, I make sure you do this and do that. And, and they like keep their eyes lasered on me the whole time. And so then I feel like that kind of pressure ramps it up. And so then with my niece baby, I was just holding her for hours and hours and hours. And it was just like nice. It's so fun. I feel like I was always very nervous. I used to always say like, oh, I'm not really a baby baby person. Once they start getting a personality, it's like a lot more fun. I mean, you said that on the Patreon this week. Yeah, I think I did. You said that like six days ago. Yeah, I said that when I only knew her for one day and then I knew her for two days and I said, oh, there's actually something really nice about this. Yeah, I guess she did have a personality. She just like hadn't opened up to you specifically yet. No, but it's not even about the personality. I just didn't get like the whole to do about like little babies. And then after two days, I was like, no, this is actually awesome. <laughs> I think I knew her for like an hour when we recorded the Patreon. And then when I knew her for like three hours, I was like, okay, it's so fun. They're so cute. And I used to be really scared for you to have babies because I was like, oh my God, will Claire even want to hang out with me anymore? And then I was like, no, will I even want to hang out with Claire? <laughs> I feel like there's a lot of just sitting around when you have a little baby. Yeah, you just hang out, which is like kind of what we do already. And instead of looking at your phone, you look at a baby and then your phone. <laughs> That's a dream. <laughs> I know. Um, okay. Do we have to do it? Speaking of a 10 pounder that you just kind of have to sit with. <laughs> Can I like give a quick rundown? I think that you guys need to know how I feel before we go into this. Yeah, me too. This book really is for the Barbara Streisand stan. Stan. It is for somebody who's seen everything she's ever done, listened to all 62 albums, watched all 25 films, and just said, I need more. I want to know every thought. It was a lot like, remember back in the days, the DVDs, when there'd be like a director's cut where they just talked over and they gave director's commentary the whole time? Imagine if you watch that for somebody's entire career and their career was like this incredible career of 50 years. And I guess actually time wise, I think the audiobook was like 49 hours. Ay. So I guess that's what it was. It was just director's cut after director's cut after director's cut. I knew the words Barbara Streisand. I knew that she was a woman who had a lot of note. And I didn't really know anything that she did. And I will say... This book is kind of about what a genius she is and how she is the smartest person in the world and everything that she's ever wanted to do came naturally and anybody who disagreed with her is probably stupid and she's even better than she remembered. And also every man was kind of in love with her. And Well, no spoilers. <laughs> and I will say I was ready to give it to her. Much like Mariah Carey, I say sometimes people are just fucking that great and God bless you. You were the best. You showed up. You did the damn thing. I'm on your side. Toot that horn. And then I looked down and I was on page 300. <laughs> And page 300 is quite a ways into a book, oftentimes done with a book. I still had 700 more pages of what a fucking genius she was as reported by her and corroborated by every good review she ever got in her life and also letters of people who loved her and memories about every time she was right and somebody else was wrong. It's too much. I will say I think that the only enjoyable way to consume this book, even for a Streisand stan, is if you love some of her work watch that piece of work and then read that chunk of the book. I agree. Like, I think that reading it as commentary as you move through her life and discography over the course of like five years would make this a reasonable experience. I think reading it all at once, like I know we read things too fast. Most books are not meant to be consumed at the pace that we like power through them. And so I try to give credit to that. But I don't think there's any way to like sit down and enjoy this book in like one sitting. You have to read switching up for other books and other movies and other things in between. Even over the course of one month, it's too much. Yeah. It took her 10 years to write. It should take you like one year to read. Yeah. I think you leave it in your bathroom. I agree. Like I know we always make fun of some comedy books as bathroom books because they're like impersonal little like bits that you're going to read on the toilet. Like I kind of felt that way about this. Me too. It's a long book, but it's well labeled. So if you watched Funny Girl and you're like interested in the creation of it, if you watched Yentl, that's 100 pages. We actually wrote an article for the Washington Post, shout out ourselves, about the best memoirs that came out this year. And the article was actually due the week before this book came out. And then the article came out right after this book came out. And there was like hundreds of comments being like, why not Barbara Streisand? And now that I've read it, I'm like, oh, this would not have been on the list. There's no way all those people who are yelling at us about what about Barbara Streisand read it. No. 
Because that was like two days after the book came out. Anyway, let's get into it. My name is Barbara, which it's not. It's Barbara. But she changed it to Barbara. From a song that somebody else wrote. So the prologue of this book gets into first her physical appearance. People have always focused on it because she's not your classic movie star type. And no one can really decide if she's beautiful or weird looking. And they've settled on kind of both. Over the year, I was called a sour persimmon, a ferocious hamster, a myopic gazelle, a seasick ferret. Was I really that odd looking? They also called her a Babylonian queen, also a basset hound. She really is like, well, what is it? She also says that a lot of people have lied about her. She talks about a friend of hers who was at someone else's house. And he said, I can't believe you're going to Barbara Streisand's house. I heard she's a bitch. And this man goes, well, I've worked with her a ton. And she's never been a bitch to me. He goes, no, it's true. She's a bitch. That's the power of a printed word. And there was no hope in changing that man's mind. He chose to believe some writer who had never met me rather than the person who really knows me. That upsets me deeply. Why couldn't he accept the truth? I like facts. I have a great respect for facts. And the idea of making something up really bothers me. So I finally said yes to writing this book after dancing around the idea for ages. And that's why I'm writing this book, because I feel an obligation to the people who are truly interested in my work and the process behind the work and perhaps the person behind the process. So here it goes, dot, dot, dot. And she really does accomplish that goal. If you are interested in every single factual moment and the person behind the process. I mean, she will do two to three pages on courting someone to direct a movie who ultimately turns it down. She did a 50-page explanation for why The Normal Heart did not get made with her production company. And it kind of feels like, I don't know, Barbara, if you have 1,000 pages here, maybe we leave out the parts that didn't happen. (laughs) (laughs) Or even reduce them to like two sentences to say there was a couple of projects that were super important to me. And because of like movie-making politics, they just never happened. Yeah. Because she has a lot of chapters called No Regrets. And that could be a chapter of regrets. Here are movies that I wish I had made. Yeah. So Barbara Streisand was born April 24th, 1942, and you'll never believe what her favorite number is. 24. Wow. I guess 24, 42, there's something there. Can I say something? She's 81 right now. She is a very interesting old Hollywood star because I don't know what era to associate her with. And reading this book was really weird because she loves the name drop. She drops every name that's ever been named. And there are people where I'm like, oh, my God, I can't believe you existed as like a famous person at the same time as that was a famous person. But you're also a famous person now. She has lasted forever. She got in there quick and she stayed. Her staying power is insane. Like, I can't believe she was friends with Marlon Brando and Julia Roberts. And Frank Sinatra. Yeah, like, I agree. Because at first she's naming all these names. First of all, they're before my time. And then also I'm not like a theater gal. So I didn't know all these Broadway people. But then she's like, Nick Nolte. I'm like, Nick Nolte. I know him. Yeah. Ben Stiller and Meet the Fockers. I'm like, Meet the Fockers. I know Meet the Fockers. And then you like, you have your Jack Nicholson's and people like that. But she'll be like, anyway. So then I cross paths with Judy Garland and Greta Garbo. And I'm like, how? How? So she was raised in Brooklyn, which if you've ever heard of Barbara Streisand, surely you know about that. She is actually from Williamsburg. Yeah. That's where we're from From. (laughs) in a way that's where our friendship is from that's so true our friendship was born on a walk up in pulaski street and she opens with she does not like to be lied to she was lied to as a child and that's where her hatred of lies comes from and that i think is the rub that i have with this book is i think that some people who feel that they weren't given the truth confuse lies of omission with regular lies i do think a lie of omission is bad but i don't think that not expressing every detail out loud for the rest of time then constitutes a lie of omission. I would almost even say, who likes to be lied to? Like, no one likes to be... Well, some people like to be lied to. Lie to me, baby. But I do think, like, most people like to be lied to in the way that they can pretend is the truth. And she allows liars in her life. And then also, I don't know, she also uses this as permission to be rude to people. She's like, well, I hate lying. That's why I had to tell you your shirt was ugly. And you're like, okay, it feels like there could have been somewhere in the middle. Yeah. But like, to me, the reason this book is so long is because I think she thinks it's like lying to not tell you every thought that's ever entered her mind if she's telling you her life story. And I'm like, no, 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 that's just editing. I guess I feel like that comes from a Self-centeredness. Yeah. Yeah. But I think she justifies it by being like, well, it'd be a lie if I didn't tell you exactly why this person directed that movie. I think she is somebody who feels she has been very wronged by the press, more wronged than anybody else in the history of time. 
And this is her way of correcting 50 years of if you had less than stellar opinions of her, you actually were just wrong. Yes. Anybody who had an opinion that was different than her is incorrect and had misinformation. And here she is here to set the record straight about why if you don't adore her, you're in the wrong. Yes. And can I tell you, I almost adored her. I gave her 300 pages. And if at 300 pages, I had looked up and said, if there had been 200 pages after the 300 pages, I would have said, God bless. You earned it. Yeah. Anyway, so she's coming home from like overnight camp and she gets in the car and her mom's like, we're moving to Flatbush. And this is Lou, Lou Kind. And then it turns out Lou Kind is going to be her new stepfather and her mom is pregnant with her new sister. I never knew my father. There are no photographs of him holding me as a baby. My father was only 35 years old when he died of a heart attack. Suddenly, Diana Rosen Streisand was a widow at 34 with two small children. Shelly was nine and I was 15 months. Years later, my mother told me that for months after my father died, I would climb up on the window ledge to wait for him to come home. In some ways, I'm still waiting. When I was older and I asked her why she never talked about my father, she said, I didn't want you to miss him. I never understood my mother's logic. So that was like the basis of her childhood. And she talks a lot about how her mom, you know, was 35, widowed with two kids and just could not handle it and neglected Barbara. And she felt that nobody ever defended her. Her brother wouldn't fight her battles for her. She felt that she was invisible in the home. She has this memory of walking in on her mom and her stepdad having sex and just like walking out and nobody noticed she was there. And she's like, that's how it always felt, just invisible. Suddenly, I had a stepfather who seemed to resent my brother and me. And her brother was a little bit older, so he had a bit more of a foundation, she feels, for this situation, whereas she just felt so ignored, so looked over. Her stepfather would just either completely ignore her or say something rude about her. And she just like didn't know what she could do to get his attention. I would crawl on my belly under his line of sight when he was watching the TV to not block his view, but it didn't work. He didn't treat me any better. And I think that's when I unconsciously decided I would never lower myself for any man. And I think that that is interesting that she believes that's a distinction. I want to come back to it. I want to put a flag in that. I hated my stepfather. I didn't like the way he mistreated my mother and he never spoke to me. So meanwhile, around town, she gets good grades. She's quite outspoken. She's got all this independence and a lot of chutzpah. I couldn't rely on my mother. She learned that very early. She had tinnitus in her ear. And she's like, I didn't even tell my mom because I knew my mom would be like, well, what am I even supposed to do for you? As a little girl, she would take herself to the doctor. Years later, I realized that when my father died, I didn't lose only him. My mother left me emotionally as well. I can't blame her for that. She was suddenly a widow with two kids to support. I asked her once when I was an adult why she never hugged me or showed me any affection or said words like, I love you. I didn't have time, she replied. And my parents never said those words to me, but I knew they loved me. She just assumed I knew how she felt, but I didn't. She's obsessed with this book called The Four Agreements, and she quotes it like constantly. But ironically, she only cares about two of the agreements because she can't remember the last two. Mm-hmm. She has a couple things in this book that she says like a dozen times, and they are quoting The Four Agreements, which is the ones that matter to her is never assume and always stay true to your word. She quotes that she hates fitting. She hates photo shoots. And then a big quote she loves that she says maybe six or seven times in this 1,000-page book is that she quit therapy because she finds herself boring. She's not very interested in talking about herself. But she's had like 30 therapists. I mean, if you have a book so long that you're repeating the line, I quit therapy because I never found talking about myself that interesting multiple times, maybe you do find yourself interesting. It's fine. You just had to admit it. But if we could have cut out all the times you tried to prove to us that you didn't find yourself interesting, maybe we could have gotten through the book faster. So when she's 14 years old, her and her friends start going into the city and seeing plays. It's like under $2. She doesn't remember if it's $1.89 or $1.98. And they start seeing plays every single Saturday. And she is fascinated. She loves dramas. And she sees this girl playing like a Jewish character on stage. And she's like, why not me? So she starts taking acting classes. And it's interesting because she kind of out of nowhere is like, when I was 16, I wanted to be in this summer stock program. They had this thing where you could be an intern for $500, which means you paid $500 to be their free labor. But she's able to do it because she has some money that her grandpa had left her. Her mom says no, but my mother and I did not have the typical mother-daughter relationship. I always had a certain power over her. Or maybe it was that I was so relentless that I wore her down. And so she has this thing where she's like, I go out there. I have so much fun. And that was it. My path was set. What a glorious summer. She gets a role. She gets good reviews. And she's just like, I'm going to be a fucking actress. So it turns out her mom had taken her on some auditions when she was very young. Her mom had like kind of had some aspirations for stardom. She was like pretty and talented at singing, but just like never followed through with any of it. But she saw that Barbara was very talented and she would like sing in the hallway in their home. She would always be singing. And so she took her to some auditions when she was younger. She just like didn't get them. So she graduates high school a semester earlier, a year earlier. 
so she can move into Manhattan, try to start taking acting classes. And she's auditioning for these acting classes. Oh, she also went to the Cherry Lane Theater, which still exists. Still shows some pretty good shows. And she just like loved it. And so she was like, can I volunteer here and just like watch and learn about theater? And she meets Anita and Alan, who end up becoming like very important in her acting education. And she like becomes good friends with them. And then she is just like kind of a part of the theater world. Years later, he explained that what he found himself responding to almost against his will was my aching desire. I was so raw, so primitive, so open that he capitulated. He offered to let me come to his classes in exchange for babysitting their young son, Gregory, who was a sweetheart. I basically fell in love with the whole family. So she starts working there. She is like doing pretty well in acting class. And so someone asks her to be their reading partner when they audition for the actor's studio, which you might know of from inside the actor's studio. It was founded by Lee Stradsberg, the father of Method. She goes to this audition to read with the other person. And then they see her and they're like, you should audition. So she auditions and then they're like, actually, you're not ready yet. And she's like, well, then fuck you. (laughs) She doesn't say that, but she really has a chip on her shoulder about not being accepted to the acting studio when she was like young. So right away, she's auditioning for everything. She's in some play called Driftwood, which I think is shut down after one night. It also was just in an attic or something. And do you know who else was in it? But Joan Rivers. Isn't that crazy? I thought she was funny, although the play wasn't a comedy, and so lucky to be from a wealthy family on Long Island. Not only did she have a father, but he was also a doctor. Wow. Anyway, so she's doing Driftwood. She's living in the city. She has some little dead-end job working at a printer. She also has this thing. She read it in a book called The Quintessence of Ibsenism by George Bernard Shaw. The quote is, thought transcends matter. And that's something that's spoken to her her whole life. She really believes that thought transcends matter is basically her version of manifestation. And then for this book, she went back to that play to see where she could find the quote. And it turns out it was a quote she had invented herself. So she made up mind over matter. (laughs) Well, wherever it came from, it's an amazing concept. Because if thought can transcend matter, that meant that if I could think something, want something, maybe I could make it happen. I knew that the mind was very powerful, even as a child. She really does believe in manifestation. Yeah. She ends up having to move home for a little bit. And then she like moves in with her friend Barry, who is like kind of her boyfriend, but kind of not because he's gay. She has another hourly gig to pay the bills. At one point, she was an usher at a theater and she says, I would hide my face because I was pretty sure I would be famous someday. and I didn't want anybody remembering that I had shown them to their seats. Oh my God. She also has this part where she's like, I knew I'd be famous and I hated making my bed. And I was so excited for someday when I could like pay someone to make my bed. And that is so Jason Derulo to me in the way that he was always like, I hate cleaning my room and someday I'm just going to be famous and pay someone to clean my room. Good for them, Jason and Barbara, two equally famous people. Anyway, so then she does this like singing competition at a nightclub. So the nightclub circuit was huge then. And she sings, she wins. And what's crazy is nobody had heard her sing before and she had never had a voice lesson in her life. And one day she tells her friend, she's like, I'm just going to go over there and win the $500. And they're like, well, can you sing? And she's like, yeah. And they're like, okay, sing for us. And she's like, no, that makes me nervous. (laughs) They're like, well, how are you going to sing for a talent competition if you don't sing for us? So she turns around. They're brought to tears. When I turned around, they both had tears running down their cheeks. I was shocked and very pleased. So she wins the singing competition and gets a residency at the Bon Soir. And she's like, well, I guess it'll be fine. But I'm an actress, not a singer. But like, we'll do this for now. And everyone is obsessed with her. Like she crushes it at the Bon Soir. Her two week stint gets turned into an 11 week stint. And they only have to move on because they've already booked someone for that week. People are coming from all over to see this phenom. She says at one point she tries to take a singing lesson to see if she can make sure her voice better. The woman made her pronounce things weird. That was my first and last singing lesson. What she was suggesting felt all wrong to me. I knew I had to do it my way. What came naturally to me. Anyway, I was an actress first, not a singer. So she gets a manager and he's booking her at nightclubs like across the country, across New York. And they're like, you need a different name. Your name is too complicated. And so instead of being Barbara Streisand, she just drops the middle A and becomes Barbara Streisand. A big problem she has is she says everybody pronounces her name wrong even to this day. She says it's an S, not a Z. So it's not Barbara Streisand. It's Barbara Streisand. Yeah. Which I, to be honest, cannot hear the difference really when you're talking. When you're talking at like the clip of a person who talks, people are very persnickety with pronunciations of their name. But I guess I feel like there are way more mispronounced names. She's obsessed with getting notes. So she goes on at the Bonsoir. It goes over like gangbusters. She really wants notes more than anything. And she like brings up that there was some you know, positive reviews. But overall, she's like, stop saying good job and tell me what I can do better. 
She starts chatting up there with the audience between songs. I was using reality, letting the audience in on what I was thinking and feeling. This was the discovery. After years of being told I was too serious, I finally thought, oh, maybe I am funny. Great. I can use this too. First of all, I never knew where or if the emotion was going to come in any particular song. Each night I tried to sing as if I were singing it for the first time. It is interesting how she has this skill now and not when she was on Broadway. (laughs) Every time she goes somewhere, people are coming out of the word work to watch her. Everybody's coming up to her and being like, you're such a star. You're such a star. She meets this guy who ends up being her manager to this day. Yeah. So she meets this guy named Marty and she already had a manager. So she just took his card and was like, whatever. And then when she was doing shows in Detroit, she wanted a better deal and she like wanted them to include meals. And so she called Marty and was like, my manager can't get me a good deal. So I want you to try and get me this deal. And he's like, great. I got you a raise. I got meals included. She later finds out that he took the raise out of his own pocket and was like paying her $50 a week in addition to the $150 that the club was paying her. But when he wanted to buy out her contract from her current manager, the manager ended up charging him $750, which he like borrowed off of Barbara. He fronted her some money. She fronted him some money. Like it was all, I don't even understand what contracts mean. She was opening up for comedy acts and she like didn't think any of them were that good. She takes comedy very seriously. Eventually, she comes home and she finds out that Barry, her roommate slash boyfriend slash gay friend... Who wasn't out. Yeah, has a boyfriend. And she's like, oh my God, I guess I can't live here with you. So then she just like lives nowhere. She's just like crashing. On people's couches at their office. There's like a rehearsal space that she sleeps at. Barry and I remain friends. But later, after he refused to return some tapes of me singing, I just put him out of my life. I can do that with people who disappoint me. It's not one of my finest qualities. I can build a wall and shut them out. So then she gets an audition for this Broadway play called I Can Get It For You Wholesale. And this ends up getting her an apartment, which is nice. The audition people are like, where do you live? And she's like, not really anywhere. And they're like, "Okay, well, you can't do that. So we'll get you a place. And then she goes to this audition and they love her and they ask her to come back. And she's like, I can't. I have a hair appointment. And they're like, what? And she's like, well, you can just come to my show later. And they're like, no, can you come back and audition after your hair appointment? And she's like, "Okay, fine. So I went to the hairdresser and when I got back to the theater, I walked on stage and asked, so what do you think? They were taken aback, assuming I was talking about my audition. No, my hair. I said, it's different. Do you like it? Anyway, so she got the job as Miss Marmalstein and I can get it for you wholesale. And she and the director, Arthur Lambert or something. She has a really hard time respecting directors. And with this one, I was like, okay, I get your point. And at this point, I was like, okay, she's a genius and everyone should just listen to her. But I also feel like there is kind of an inherent flaw in being like an actor who can't be directed. I don't know that there's ever been a point in her life where she's thought somebody had a better opinion than her. Well, that's what I mean is I'm like, that is not good. She's like, if you agree with me, you're a genius. But if you disagree with me, you're an insecure idiot. So Miss Marmalstein in Wholesale has a big singing number. She plays a secretary. And in her audition, she had this great idea that because this is a secretary who's sitting in her secretary's chair, She would like do the song rolling around the stage in her chair. And she thought this was like a really funny thing that brought the song to life and also made sense. And so she did it. She got the job. And then in the show, the director was like, I don't want you rolling around. I want you to stand. And she was like, that makes no sense. And they had this insane back and forth all through workshops, all through previews. Finally, when they're previewing the show in Philadelphia, he's like, fucking fine. Try it your way. And she tries it her way. The crowd loves it. And she's like, see? And I guess everything is getting bad reviews except for her. They're like, everything sucks except for her. She's a genius. She's a star. She brings the house down. He obviously doesn't like that. On the show, she also meets Elliot Gould, who you may know as Ross and Monica's dad. And he's on the play too. This was Elliot's big break and mine. Unlike him, I had never looked for jobs in the chorus. Frankly, I don't think it even occurred to me. Working my way up slowly didn't figure into my plan. I was too impatient. I like instant gratification. And I always knew it was all or nothing for me. I had to go right onto the top or into another profession. I wanted a part with substance. Otherwise, it wasn't worth my time. That's the thing is I am like, okay, but you were right. And so it did work out for you. But I do think that that is such a tough take. Anyway, so they start flirting. They start dating. Meanwhile, she's fighting with the director. She has this thing where she refuses to ever do a take the same way twice, which I guess is great for film, but it's kind of tough for theater. Can I say I don't think it's good for film either? Yeah, I don't know. But he would be mad. He'd be like, I liked what you did. Can you mark it? Like, do it that way again. And she's like, I won't. I can't. And then he would get angry with me yelling, what is the matter with you? You have no discipline. You never do it the same way twice. Well, of course not. I was taught to be in the moment, to listen and react. That's what seemed right to me. Also, you were taught that that's good acting. But like, she doesn't have that much theater training. At this point, she's like 18 or 19 years old, right? Yeah. 
And she's been taking acting classes since she was 14. But like she's never been in a professional play, really. There is like a way things are done. Because if you have to do the play every day, you can't just like do something different every day and expect everyone else in the cast to like know what's going on. So she's kind of becoming a little star. She says she's a kook. There's a show called PM East, which is like a late night talk show. And she's a regular guest on it. And she says a lot of people on the show didn't like her, but they kept bringing her back because she was so interesting. She always talked about whatever she wanted to. You can see why I rub people the wrong way. I didn't play the game. I'm not sure I even knew there was a game. At this point, I still really liked that about her. Because <laughs> I like when people like don't play into the Hollywood bullshit. But then I don't like that she complains about not being accepted by the Hollywood bullshit. You can either play the game or not, but you can't say like, I don't want to play. I just want to win. It's like a fine line of there are things that are old fashioned and traditions that are just gatekeepy ways of keeping a hierarchy and keeping people down. But then there's also like etiquette that exists because it's polite to say hello to somebody. It's polite to like, listen, I was going with my gut, which is what I've relied on in my life. If I was given direction that didn't feel right, I would say no. Apparently, most young women, given their first part in a Broadway show, do not challenge the director. They feel lucky enough just to be there. That was not me. I was very independent. I think it was due to the way I was raised, which on some level was terrible, but on another level probably contributed to my success. There's such a difference between like just blindly following whatever you're told and also, again, refusing to be directed. Yeah. So she's like, I also think maybe the director had a crush on Elliot, who was her boyfriend. I kind of don't think that was it. I think he just like hated that she didn't listen to him. Arthur was a complicated man, but I knew what was going on. And I think I also knew that's the way it's going to be for me. I will do that to people. I will make them angry. She has this quote from a Joan of Arc play. He who tells too much truth is sure to be hanged. I didn't realize that I was hanging myself. She does see herself as a real truth teller. She hates lying and she thinks she gets in trouble a lot for telling the truth. Again, I go back to this fact of like, is it the truth or is it just kind of being rude? Tough to say. Anyway, so she's thinking again at the Bonsoir and this guy named Jewel is like obsessed with her. He thinks she's amazing. He keeps bringing people back to see her. He is developing a show called Funny Girl about Fanny Bryce and he like loves her. But the rest of the people who are involved with the production of this show do not get it and think that she's way too young for the role. And so he keeps being like, you just have to see her live. You just have to see her live. So he keeps bringing people one at a time to come see her. They are all brought to tears. They're all like, she's amazing. She's incredible. She has quotes from every single one of them. Just had long, exhausting talk with Barbara. And I found her very talented, very kooky, very ambitious, very riveting, very volatile, very unproductible. We'll be reading her Monday. So they're considering her for the role. Wholesale is about to close. And because she's sort of like really developing some steam as a vocalist, her manager is like, I think we can get you a record deal. So she decides to go on a little tour to sort of send her like singing career onto the next level and then she gets to deal with columbia records so while she's waiting for this funny girl thing to come around or if it'll ever come around she starts working on her first album and something that her manager marty does for her that serves her well her whole career is that he always gets her a good deal in terms of creative control yeah so she always says like it can be less money she just doesn't want to lose creative control it meant i got to choose the songs i sang and if i didn't like the way the album turned out i could can it the concept the responsibility were all mine So they're putting the album together. And it's like a huge hit. She works with Peter Matz on the arrangements and she like has a huge crush on him. And so sometimes she's afraid to tell him that she doesn't like certain parts of the arrangement. This is kind of what I wanted to come back to. I do feel that there is a recurring theme where like anytime she is attracted to a man or like wants a man to be attracted to her, she will bury her feelings. And so that first section of the book where she says like, because of my stepfather, I like learned to never lower myself for a man again. She's not happy with some of Peter Matz's work, but she won't say it until later when she's over her crush, decades later. Even Elliot Gould, her boyfriend, then husband, when they're in wholesale together, she's like, I was really happy that I was getting such good reviews, but he wasn't always getting good reviews. So I felt a little weird about getting the best reviews. And it's like, okay, well, to say like, I don't want my reviews to be better than my boyfriend's reviews, I would consider that lowering yourself for a man. I think it's just like an interesting thing that she like calls out specifically, but doesn't ever follow through with. Yeah. So she puts out this album. It goes on to win album of the year and best female vocal performance at the next Grammy Awards. Then they start doing another album. And then her and Elliot are asked to do On the Town, a production in London. And he's like, oh, of course we'll go. That's such a good idea. And she's torn because she wants to do a tour for her music. And like she thinks that her kick is going to be in her solo career, not going to London to do another show. Again, she says that she'll do it because she wants to make Elliot happy. But then he's like, no, 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 it's best for you to stay here and do this. He just like was testing her to see if she would follow him. 
So this is 1963, and she says that's the year that everything came together for her. She would have been 20, turning 21. (laughs) That took a while. Elliot basically is about to go to London for the show. They're in Miami, and he says to her, listen, I just want to give you this little ring just to seal our commitment to one another. I don't want you to stray. I want to confirm our relationship. We're marrying one another spiritually. For some reason, she keeps wearing the ring around to interviews and is shocked when everybody's like, oh, are you married? So she just starts saying yes. And then he's like, wait, are you telling people we're married? And she's like, well, I don't know what else to say. So for a while, they said they were married, but they weren't. And then they just like got married in Nevada. I think it was on this trip that someone asked me, how do you hold a note so long? After a moment of thought, I said, because I want to. It's a matter of will. I wanted to hold a note. So I did. She does her second Barbra Streisand album. And then Funny Girl comes back around. And they want to audition her again because they want to see if she can play the older, mature second act Fanny Bryce. And she like has a breakthrough about what maturity means. She nails the audition and then she becomes Fanny Bryce. The show goes through like a bunch of directors. Some of them she really doesn't respect, but the guy who finally ends up directing it, she really likes. So that was good. And then they have such a nice time workshopping the show. They're changing it up till the day. Like up until an hour before she goes out for the very first opening show in New Mm -hmm. York City. Then she's kind of struck with another letdown where she's like, oh, now that we've locked the show, I have to do the same thing every day. And she's miserable. She does, however, develop a crush. She's in the show with Sydney Chaplin, who is Charlie Chaplin's baby. Little by little, we became friends and then the friendship morphed into something more. So they start having an affair. Her and Elliot were having problems. They were drifting apart. Also, they were never really drifted together. Like they had a show fling and then she like never really knew how she felt about him. She says that when she started wearing the ring, she like wasn't really sure. When they got married, she wasn't really sure. I don't think that she ever says that she was like full on in love with Elliot. If you're into this, she gives all of the background on her understanding of the character, the this, the that, why she looked to the left, why they lit it up, why she wore red. Anyway, so she has this affair with Sydney Chaplin. And then finally, she tells Elliot, and she's like, you have to help me get out of this thing. I really shouldn't have done it. I'm sorry. And he forgives her. But then she has to go and tell him. Meanwhile, Sidney Chaplin is married. Yeah. So then when she breaks it up, he turns on her. And every night on stage, he starts berating her and saying, like, she's ugly. She's a cunt. She's a bitch. She's a whore. During the parts where he's supposed to be, like, whispering sweet nothings into her ear. So he's, like, off mic, not really speaking to the audience. He would, like, be in her ear berating her. And she would be miserable. She started having panic attacks. They kept giving him warnings, too. She finally went to the director, the director, the stage manager. They're like, you have to stop. You have to stop. And they had to fire him. On opening night of Funny Girl, when I looked for my mother in the audience, she wasn't there. Later, when I asked her why she wasn't in her seat, she said, I was too nervous. I had to walk around. She missed my performance. My mother didn't see me once again. She also says this was the turn in her career where she wasn't the underdog anymore, the kooky kid from Brooklyn that they could root for. Now she was fair game. It was a woman reporter who took some of the first shots at me. It was a profile for Life magazine. Why are women so tough on other women? Is it jealousy? Maybe. It's funny because a lot of men are awful to her. But whenever men are awful to her, it's like a one-off. But like anytime a woman is like, I didn't like that dress you wore. She's like, all women are so awful to me. She's like, what about feminism? I'm a feminist. Why aren't you? She has an opportunity to go speak to the women's directors of America. And she's like, I was going to say something about the patriarchy. But then I realized it's not even men who are holding us down. It's other women. And I'm like, totally. Okay, so then she does another album, which is, I guess, if you like want to know about how she arranged and chose songs for all of her albums, you have to read the book because I will not say it here. But then she does her first TV special, which was a really exciting opportunity because she wanted to make it a more true to her life story instead of doing a standard variety show where she would like host it and bring in variety acts. And she loved being like really creative with these specials. It went over so great. Everyone was like, that's the best TV special that's ever existed. She won a Peabody Award. People were saying, great comedian, a great actress, beautiful, haunting, girlish, ladylike, intense, hilarious. She touches you to your toes and then she knocks you out. Wow, I could retire on that review. But here's the thing. It didn't satisfy me. In fact, I kept asking, was there anything the critics didn't like? I wanted to hear more specifics, not just superlatives. So then she went on to do another album to distract her, but she still had to go and do Funny Girl every night, which was so boring. She did this crazy thing where she would do Funny Girl every night, twice on Saturday. So she was doing eight shows a week. And then at midnight, she would run down to the club because she hated singing for the club until she lost it. And then she would go back and just try doing different songs. She was starring in Broadway and then running down to a jazz club to sing. Yeah. But she wasn't a singer. She doesn't consider herself a singer. She's only done 60 albums. (laughs) But she's an actress first and a director first, first. And then before that, a producer first, 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 first. And before that, someone who's just a little bit insecure and humble. 
That's so true. She's so humble. And listen, I don't think she should be humble, but you can't write a thousand pages about how every time you thought something was a flop, now you look back and realize that it was actually the greatest thing that's ever been done. Every single time she was like, oh, this ended up being a flop. But now that I look at the reviews, I guess everybody loved it. and It was a huge success. The only thing that was genuinely a flop was called Up the Sandbox. And she's like, I think if you guys watched it now, you'd realize it was actually just ahead of its time and better than anything that was coming out at the time. That's so true. And I was just like, that's fine. Think that. It probably is true. But you can't then also be like, you don't understand. I didn't have a dad. I was so insecure. Every time she doesn't even say like, actually, this was so, so good. She goes, you know, I remember just feeling so down and thinking the reviews were so bad. And now that I look at it, the reviews were so good. And maybe, maybe it was good. Funny Girl is still going great, but she's so fucking sick of it. And finally, her contract is up. And so she gets to leave. Funny Girl was still packing people in, but I couldn't wait to get out. I hung a big calendar on my dressing room wall and crossed off each night. But then on her last show, she like fully cries. And she's like, oh my God, I like never cry. So that was crazy. They curtain called and they curtain called. And then they're like, what if we do the show in London? And she was like, oh, no, I don't want to. Somehow they convinced her, though, by being like, you can go to art museums. So she goes. Yeah. She loves art. I'm not going to get into it, but there's a lot of paintings she almost bought, but didn't. And they would have been worth a lot more money. And there's some that she almost bought and then did. And they're something. She does say at one point she went through this cleansing period where she sold all her stuff. She somehow never mentions that period in her book. Yeah. They shoot her for Vogue. She's like a real star now. And then she gets so nauseous towards the end of her Europe trip. She like can't make it anywhere. And then they're like, oh, you're pregnant. And she's like, who's pregnant? And they're like, you're pregnant, silly. And I guess she had like taken a test that back then it would take like five days to get a result. And so they like didn't tell her. And they told her friends instead. How amazing. I was so happy. I finally felt normal for once. And then I thought, oh, my God. Marty had just set up this huge concert tour of 20 cities back in the States. So as soon as I finished in London, I was supposed to do that. And then there was the third TV special. And most importantly, the movie of Funny Girl. It all sounded like so much work when all I wanted to do was stay home and veg, be pregnant, read about babies. So she ends up agreeing to do some of the shows, but not all of the shows. And then she like just has a really magical pregnancy. And then she has her baby. And she said she felt so creative when she was pregnant. So that was awesome. And then the movie Funny Girl comes out. Well, then it starts getting made. Yeah, the concept of the movie Funny Girl. Obviously, she wants to be the star of it. And Ray, the producer who owned the rights to Funny Girl, was like, you can't do it. I'm giving it to someone else. And she's like, what do you mean? I invented that part. And he's like, ah, only if you sign a three movie deal with me. And she's like, I'm not giving my life away. Just do this role. Fine, do it without me. So then he starts being like, fine, I will. And she was like, I don't know. He is such a fucking bastard. So finally she gives in and she commits to a three movie deal in order to be Fanny Bryce, the role she kind of invented. Yeah. And so then she moves to LA with her little baby. Also, okay, at one point they decide to do a big outdoor concert. I don't really know how this fits in, but she's so nervous that no one will come and they do this like huge show in Central Park. Then it turns out to be like the biggest show that's ever happened anywhere, I guess. So it turns out they were happy. But something did happen that night that truly frightened me. I forgot the lines to one of my songs I knew best when the sun comes out and there were no teleprompters to rescue me back then. I went blank and I was not charming or funny about it. It was my worst nightmare come true and it was happening in front of 150,000 people. It really threw me. I didn't perform a live concert setting again for 27 years. And then later in the book, she's like, okay, that wasn't like completely true. I did perform sometimes, but like not really. After she plays Fanny Bryce on Broadway, she almost never does live performances again. It's interesting. Yeah, she does like a couple of Vegas things and then a couple of fundraisers for like the rest of her life, I think. So she moves to L.A. and she's the belle of the ball and they're throwing parties in her honor and they're interviewing her, but she hates it. She hates going to a party. She hates being interviewed. She doesn't like the fame. She just likes the other part. She says she has a reputation for being rude, but really she was just scared. But she also like kind of was rude. OK, this is something that Claire and I have gone back and forth with. She was kind of rude. She like is obsessed in this book with debunking every rumor about her. And a lot of the big rumors are that she's hard to work with, that she's rude and that she's controlling. And I don't mean to say this in a way where like, I don't think she should work. We say this all the time. We'll be like, oh, this person is an asshole. And everyone will be like, don't cancel them. And I'm like, I'm not canceling them. People don't have to die because they're assholes. I do think she's rude and hard to work with and controlling. Every story she tells about being on set with her, I'm like, oh, that does sound hard. She like exerts quite a bit of control. She's obsessed with not listening to directors. That's kind of a lot of control. Yeah. So they're doing Funny Girl and she goes through a bunch of writers on the script to try to turn it into a movie. 
she's picky. She wants what she wants. And she says she does her best to live up to a director's vision. But I don't think that's true. I don't think that's true. And later she talks about, she's like, oh, I didn't realize that people weren't always as hands-on with scripts as I was. And I was like, yeah, that's why people were a bit put off by it. I don't think it's necessarily bad, but I do think it's true. You are controlling. I don't think that's bad. I get it. It's your face. It's your name. It's your career. You want it to be right. Yeah. You are difficult unless everybody agrees with you. Yeah. But should somebody else want to do their job with their opinion, that's like a big problem to you. Anyway, her and Elliot are separating. The truth is, I don't think either of us was too upset about the separation. Something had changed between us. Frankly, we'd been drifting apart for a couple of years. When he went to New York, I didn't miss him as much as I should have. I was too busy falling in love with film. Making Funny Girl totally consumed me. I don't know that they ever were like fully on the same page. I feel like they hooked up on a set and then stayed together out of convenience because they like kind of liked each other and hated being alone. I think she said yes to him before she found out she was about to become like a star and really hot. Yeah. She didn't know she had better options. And she was only 20 years old. And then they were just too busy to break up. And then she got pregnant. Yeah. She like loves watching the dailies. She's like obsessed with the filmmaking process. She likes to watch what they filmed that night after they wrap for the day. She really does get like completely consumed by a project whenever she's full in on something. And she hasn't made that many movies. And I think it's because she can't do anything else when she's making a movie. So her co-star in this was Omar Sharif. Which was big news because he was Egyptian and she was Jewish. And that was like a whole thing, a whole thing. She did not find him attractive at all. But then as they got going, she started like liking him and he liked her and they started playing off each other. And then he like wrote her letters for years about how in love he was with her. And he took her out to dinner and they had a small affair. And he was like, please move to Paris with me. Please do anything. And she was just like, Ugh, as if. And then years later, his grandson had to say to Barbara Streisand about his own grandmother. My grandfather always says it should have been you. And she's like, that may be true. We get it, Barbara. You're very beautiful. Everyone loves you. Everybody loves you even more than they love the wife with whom they share a life now. She really loved the director, Willie. But they had this one part that they really disagreed on where like he wanted her to say this line strong and she wanted to say it vulnerably. Willie didn't agree with me and he seemed very adamant. So I did it his way. But it's the one moment I don't believe in the film because I think it's the wrong choice. She really is just like, if it's not my way, it's the wrong way. Okay, this is a really interesting thing she does. So she also gets very hands-on with the editing. And as you know, film used to be shot on literal film. And then they would literally trim the film away and like discard of the scraps. And she keeps the scraps. You know that saying, they left it on the cutting room floor. No, they didn't. They left it in Barbara Streisand's record book. And she has gone back. I'll just spoiler alert it. On a number of movies on the 25-year, 50-year anniversary, she'll go back in and like demand they let her recut it her way. So there's movies where the directors have died and she's like, listen, I know that they would admit that I was right and that they fucked up the film. Let me go back in and fix it. And they'll finally be like, okay, fine. We'll let you do like a second edition. But they're like, we can't go back and change a 25-year-old movie. She's done this to three or four films where she's like, I have it in my vault. Once she made Warner Brothers go to their vault in a salt mine and be like, dig it up. What you were leaving for aliens, I want it. And in my house, I'm going to fix this film. She like has all of the equipment. She like buys it so that she can just like edit on her own and make it the way she wants it to be. I like that about her. I mean, I like these insane things. I like that she's such a fucking psych. She's a psycho. Yes. That is crazy. 50 years later to be like, I just rewatched the movie for the first time and I stand by the fact that it was wrong and I was right and I need to fix it. I like have nothing but respect and awe for that kind of personality. But then you can't sit here and play this game of being like, anybody who thinks I'm difficult is wrong. I'm so easy. No, you're not. You're crazy and it's fine. Hitchcock used to like scare his women to death. I think he would beat actors if he was allowed, but yeah, I'm not saying you're killing anybody, but you're difficult. Okay. That's what I mean is I don't think that any of her behaviors are like behaviors that are the end of the fucking world. She's right. This is an art. And so artists are nut jobs. The way movie making has turned into such a fucking business where they're like, why can't AI be everything? I would rather a million Barbara Streisands than a million whoever runs Netflixes. But it's difficult. Like she seems like a nightmare to work with. She seems like a nightmare if you have a different perspective. If you're just like showing up, clocking in and be like, well. She also seems to have a little bit of a problem, not only with like a disagreement, but with you not like reading what she said perfectly. And so I think that like working with her would be very complicated and like not that satisfactory for anyone else because like you're not getting to make art. You're making her art and yeah. it will take you 19 hours a day. And now it's time for How Is This Memoir Like Pizza brought to you by Pizza Hut. Because nothing is more hot and piping and delicious than both a good memoir and a fresh pizza. Mm -hmm. And you got to listen to this podcast instead of reading the book because Listen to What Podcast leaves you hands-free to eat pizza. Beautiful stuff, Claire. <laughs> How do you feel this memoir was like pizza? 
Okay, so Pizza Hut has my favorite pizza. I also sometimes like to add a pepperoni. I like the mix of sweet and savory and a little kick in the mouth. And I'm sorry, but that is this week's memoirist. She is sweet when she needs to be. And she'll also kick you in the mouth when you're wrong. I mean, she's had multiple directors fired. She has written angry letters back to critics. She has held on to every single piece of criticism of all time just so that she could go back and prove them wrong. And that is a spicy little personality. But at the end of the day, why is she doing it? She's doing it because she's creating some of the sweetest movies and musicals of all time. That's the perfect combo. And that's also the perfect combo for pizza. This memoir reminds me of pizza because I think that she treats her career the way you order pizza in that you don't always order garlic bread, but then you wish you had it. Every single movie that she's in, there is a scene that gets edited out that she wish was back in and then later she adds it back in. But that's not how ordering food works, right? Once you don't order it, it's not there. And then for the rest of your life, you wish you ordered garlic bread and you think about it and you always talk about it. And that is how the scenes of the movies that don't make the original cut end up in this book. She's just constantly referencing the movie as if that scene was in it and as if the scene should have been in it. And like it was it should have been there all along, just like the garlic bread should have been there all along. Also dessert. Dessert, too. That triple chocolate brownie. I mean, I think when you're younger, you go, let's keep it slim. Like, let's keep it to a minimum. Let's just get the pizza. But as you get older, you realize life is about adding the triple chocolate brownie. Life is about adding the scenes back in. That's pizza, baby. And that's growing up. And that's how this memoir is like pizza. Thank you, Pizza Hut. Anyway, so her and Elliot break up and she gets nominated for the Oscar for Best Actress in Funny Girl. And she ties with Katherine Hepburn. That's so interesting that they tie. She is a nut. She always like is sticking gum places. It's so disgusting. When she used to do her shows at the Bon Soir, she would like just take her gum out of her mouth and stick it to the microphone and then put it back in her mouth after her set was over. And when she auditioned for Wholesale, she like walked into the audition with gum in her mouth, stuck it on the bottom of the seat and then like put it back in her mouth after the audition. And they like thought she was doing a character. And then she, again, when she wins the Oscar, she like takes her gum out of her mouth and sticks it to the bottom of her seat and like gets up on stage. Why was she chewing gum at the Oscars? I don't know. If you guys know who Anthony Newley is, they had an affair. And to this day, he's like, it should have been you. They're all in love with her. It always should have been her. And then she does Hello, Dolly. She's miserable the whole time. She's like, I'm glad someone thought it was good, but I thought it sucked. Gene didn't agree with me, so I talked to Ernie. He liked my suggestion, and we ended up shooting it both ways. Even Gene admitted that my way was better when he saw the dailies, so that's what's in the film. But she still didn't like the movie. She did not think the director knew what he was doing, like, basically the whole time. She felt that the director, like, didn't get the movie. That's a problem she has a lot. She also, it's the first time she becomes, like, very famous, and she gets out of her car, and she's being kind of harassed by people for attention, and she's like, I do not like being famous. This is when I really began to hate, quote-unquote, stardom. Then she has a whole chapter about Marlon Brando. They were good friends from the beginning till the end. They would talk on the phone for hours. They never hooked up. He also is in love with her. He says, kiss yourself in the mouth for me, darling. I wish we had fucked more. But he does say this thing that I have to shout out. When they first met, she was married to Elliot. And he says, I don't think you're going to be with Elliot much longer. I was taken aback. I'm married to him. What do you mean? He's not good looking enough for you. At first, I was offended. I know most people wouldn't call Elliot gorgeous, but I certainly thought he was nice looking. It was only years later that I realized how insightful Marlon's comment was. Did he know about my search for beauty at that point than I did? Was he searching for the same thing? Search for beauty? That's so funny to be like, I used to be married to a goofy looking guy and now I'm married to a smoke show. And that's like a personality trait. <laughs> it is really bananas to me to be like, you know, he said my husband was ugly, but then I realized he was astute. <laughs> I knew it, but I didn't know it spiritually. And he was right. He was just very attuned with me. More attuned than I was with myself. That hotness really mattered. And I just didn't know it yet. Anyway, she loves Brando. He loved her. They all loved her. In that last moment of The Way We Were, you were so vulnerable that I fell in love with you all over again. We should have done more when we were younger, fucked a lot, had children. Go kiss yourself in the mirror for me. Everybody's in love with her, even Frank Sinatra. That's so true. Anyway, she's always like, me? Sexy? Erotic? I, I didn't see it, but you know who did? Everybody else. <laughs> Everybody that was. She says, I never thought of myself as beautiful, but everyone kept saying I was the most beautiful person they'd ever seen. But to this day, every man who's ever met me is in love with me. And now that I think about it, they're so right. I was like actually the most beautiful. Okay. On a clear day, you can see forever. Call me stupid. I don't care. She explains the plot in detail, like thorough detail. I do not understand what this movie is about. <laughs> I have no fucking idea. It's anyway. about hypnosis and an afterlife and magic powers. And she like doesn't really get meditation. 
But then she did. She like got really into Deepak Chopra. She like went to a meditation retreat with him. And that's when she like understood meditation. And then at her house, she's like very, you know, she loves details. So she had them plant all these flowers. And then she got home and she's like, these are the wrong color flowers. But then the next day, she wakes up and it's the right color flower. And she's like, oh my God, did they change the flowers? And then she calls Deepak Chopra and he's like, no, you changed the color of the flowers with your mind. And she's like, oh my God. Thought transcends matter, just like I invented in my head. And then she plays this girl, Claudia and the owl and the pussycat. And that was like a fun role where she like almost had to go nude, but then they were like, no. The thing is, so she's trapped in this contract. So she's doing three movies. So this is one for him. And the guy Ray did sound like an asshole. He's always fucking with her and making her nervous. Then she dates the Prime Minister of Canada, Justin, not Justin. Pierre. Pierre Trudeau. Justin's dad. And she was like, it was amazing. He was smart. He was sexy. We would talk about politics. And then he would roll around in the snow. He was such a Canadian. At one point, he's like, let's just go to Russia and have tea. And she's like, I can't. I'm on Broadway. They broke up because he was 50 and he was like finally ready to start a family. And she's like, I don't know if I'm at that place right now where I could just have kids. He was 52 and she was 27. Yeah. And so she like wasn't ready to settle down and be like a politician's wife. She still had things she wanted to achieve. So she said no. And then he got married and had Justin Trudeau. And like they stayed friends. She stays friends with everybody. She says on her birthday, she like always gets flowers from her exes. I felt so proud when Justin was elected prime minister of Canada in 2015. Then she does this movie called What's Up, Doc? What's Up, Doc came about because Elliot, her ex-husband, he had a mentee B and they called Tell her. The, there's people who listen who are in their 40s. Tell them what it means. A mental breakdown. And he says actually it wasn't the drugs he was doing. It was reality that he had the problem with. You know when you're a gambling addict and addicted to drugs? But sometimes a cold dose of reality is what really shakes you up. Uh, why would he do drugs and gamble if reality was going good? <laughs> <laughs> How could they catch him if he was gambling? <laughs> anyway. He freaks out and walks off the side of a movie and they're like, he's going to owe us so much fucking money if a movie does not get made right now. So she reads the script of the movie and she's like, maybe we could rewrite it so I play the role instead. But she reads it and she's like, actually, this movie fucking sucks, but I'll make a movie. And they make this movie called What's Up, Doc? Which she thinks is going to suck. And then it doesn't. Oh my God. Sorry. There was another album in here. Happily, the album went on to become a big success as well. Quickly going gold. So the worst decision of her career is she thinks that this movie is not funny at all and going to completely bomb. So she sells back her rights to the back end to Columbia Pictures for more money up front. And then it goes on to be like the biggest movie of the fucking year. And then she says it's the worst business decision she's ever made. She did it with Ryan O'Neill, who she also dated. Everybody was in love with her. My note here is thought it was bad. It was good. <laughs> the secret to Barbara Streisand is everything she does is so good. And sometimes she doesn't think it's good, but it turns out everybody loves it. And then sometimes... She thought the critics didn't like it, but she goes back and the critics loved it. Also, sometimes some of the critics didn't like it, but she realizes the only critics who matter are the ones who did like it. Whenever somebody analyzes her and comes to the conclusion that she is like the genius of our times, like she's the genius of the century, she's like, it feels so good to be seen. <laughs> it's so funny. It's just like, could you imagine if someone came up to me and said, Claire, you are the funniest, most beautiful, incredible comedian I've ever seen. Everything you say, every word, every joke is perfect. It's impeccable. And I was like, finally, you get you me. Get me. <laughs> Then Kennedy gets assassinated. That was personal to her because you know what? Kennedy really wanted more than anything before he died to hear her sing again. He thought she was incredible and she gets it. Oh my God. Can you imagine if you were John F. Kennedy and you wanted to hear Barbara Streisand sing again, but instead you got your head shot? That is not what he wanted. Dang. Okay. So then she decides that if everyone's going to call her a control freak, she's going to start her own production company. So she is like, I'm going to make my own movie. And the movie she comes up with is called Up the Sandbox, which is a subtle drama about the choice between more motherhood or a life of your own. It's a woman who has like all these fantasies. One of the fantasies that she's like blowing up Lady Liberty because she doesn't think there's actually liberty for women in America. She's having a conversation with Fidel Castro and she's kissing a Black Panther, I think, in one scene. So it's this woman, this housewife who has all these fantasies. And then she finds out she's pregnant. And the movie is about whether or not she decides to keep the kid. And of course, she keeps the kid. But she like considers an abortion, which is an act of feminism. Anyway, the movie bombed its fucking dick off. And she thinks it's because the ads for it made it seem like a comedy. Yeah. So people didn't know what to expect. And then also she went back and looked at the reviews and some of them said it was good. Some of them said she was brilliant and subtle and doing things and pushing boundaries. And then on final look, she decided, you know what? It was ahead of its time. I still think it's a good movie. And I still believe in its message. And women are still struggling in our society to be all that they can. Peter Rayner, the film critic, recently told a friend of mine that he thought Up at the Sandbox had been overlooked and was ripe for reevaluation. 
that would be interesting. I'd be curious to see how people respond to it today more than 50 years later. Interesting. Okay, so then she makes a movie called The Way We Were, a classique, if you will. This is a long ass chapter. Yeah, and I like don't have that much to say about it. So it was about a politically active woman who was a communist and a man that she fell in love with who was a goy. That means non-Jewish. I know about him. I'm not telling you. I'm telling you. I heard of him. The way we were is kind of the story of me and Ashley. That's so true. But it's the way we are because we'll never change. We won't grow up. So she, again, has a director that she does not respect because the director is not herself. But this movie was about politics, but they like cut most of the politics out of it. So basically, it's about two unlikely people who fall in love. She's a communist. He's like a novelist. And they fall in love. And then they break up when she's pregnant. And I guess the reason they break up is because it was set in McCarthy era, McCarthyism era. And they are going to penalize him for being married to an outspoken kook because she loves him. She has to let him go kind of thing. The movie gets scared. They just said that that's too bold. Because of actual McCarthyism. I guess this movie was made in the 70s and it had only been a few years. People weren't ready to laugh at it yet. There was pressure from the studio on the director to be like, don't make this a political movie. I think they were feeling nervous that they were treading on people's toes. And so ultimately they cut to the two scenes that have to do with that. So in the movie, she's like, it doesn't make any fucking sense. They're in love, they're in love, they're in love. And then suddenly she's like, we're not together anymore. And she does an original song. The big thing about her, she hates singing on movies now. She's like, I'm not a singer, I'm an actress. I just happen to have 100 Grammys. And that's random and not my fault. And 60 albums. So she learns guitar to write a song. And then she cuts the scene with the guitar. I don't know. Anyway, long story short, she thinks the movie's going to suck. Turns out it's like one of the hits of all time. It's like ranked the number two best love movie of all time after Casablanca. Yeah. And then also she feels that the director, Sydney, isn't looking out for her and like isn't paying attention to her. So like when she does a scene, even though she could probably have done it better, he'll just be like, okay, that's a wrap. It's done. There's a scene where she's crying and she has her hand in front of her face. And she's like, if he had just said, let's do it again without your hand in front of your face, I would have won an Oscar. But I didn't. And so she's like, the movie makes sense. And I wasn't directed good because no director is good. And I'm like, okay, but if he had said, move your hand, would you have been like, how fucking dare you? My acting process is to have my hand there. So basically, she's like begging them to put the scenes back in. And they're like, we can't. The studio said no. I felt absolutely powerless. My mind just flashed back to a moment as a young girl standing in my mother's bedroom doorway and being ignored. Once again, I felt unseen and unheard. I begged Sydney to put those two scenes back in, but he didn't. This was the moment when I thought, that's it. I had always had creative control over my albums, my TV specials, and my concerts. But now I realized I have to be more in control of my films as well. I have to direct. Anyway, they go on to be huge successes. She wins like an Oscar for Best Original Song, and she doesn't even sing it because she's too nervous to sing. When it comes out for its 50-year anniversary, she's like, let me redo it. They keep being like, no, no, no. And finally, she's like, you must. And so she does it. And she's like, and while I'm here, a star is born too. And they're like, Jesus fucking Christ. So she ends up putting out like different cuts. It's not even director's cuts. It's like Streisand cuts. And also, this movie did not count towards her three-picture deal with the studio because she like loved this movie at first. And so when she did it, Ray was like, oh, okay, that does not count as your third movie, though, because you like it. What I meant is that you had to sign on for a three-picture deal for movies that you don't like. We are now at page 400, and we're at about the time where I said, Barbara, enough. enough. So this chapter, with a little help from my friends, is about how somebody sued Nixon. So Daniel Ellsberg was on trial for leaking the Pentagon Papers, and he ran out of money for his defense. He had no money for his lawyers. So she decided to break her no more live concert rule to do a fundraiser for him. They raised $50,000. All of her friends, so many famous people show up. Joni Mitchell, Dave Geffen, George Harrison, all these people show up. They raised $50,000 for him. He's able to continue his defense. In this, they find out that Nixon had robbed his psychiatrist's office for notes on him. This leads to Watergate, which leads to the downfall of Nixon. And she says... She brought down Nixon. She goes, listen, I was a part of the chain that brought him down. I guess she was. <laughs> so then she gets into the movies that she didn't do. She turned down Clute, which is the movie that blew up Jane Fonda. So she's like, well, there would be no Jane Fonda if it wasn't for me. Also, they shoot horses, don't they? Also, Julia. Also, Cabaret. And Jane got that as well. I've said to her jokingly, I'm responsible for your career. I'm like, okay. And this is when she meets a guy named John Peters. He's a hairdresser and she needs a wig for a star is born, which is in the works now. Or no, no, it's not in the works yet. She's just doing a different movie where she wants to wear a wig. She's doing some stupid movie called For Pete's Sake. So she has to get a wig and she wants to get a good wig. So she hires this guy, John, who it turns out has never worked with a wig. And I'm like, then where did fucking John come from? 
But he's very persistent. He was just lying. He was like, I did that haircut. And it turns out all the haircuts he claimed he did were just like lies. Yeah, I guess he's a con artist. I would never be like, how do I lie to get closer to Lady Gaga? And I'd never be like, I'll pretend to be a hairdresser. He lied his way into the head of a studio. This lie with Barbara Streisand got him a job as a wig dresser, which he didn't know how to do, which got him a job as a movie producer, which he didn't know how to do, which got him a job as head of a movie studio. Which is insane because, like, she couldn't get herself to the head of a movie studio. Yeah. Men can have anything. They just need to lie hard enough and then find a woman with talent. Anyway, so he shows up and right away he's like, you got a real good ass, don't you? And she's like, oh my God, I can't believe you're talking to me like that. And so she goes out with him because he's quite persistent and she likes that about him. And he calls her a butterfly. And she's like, that's really beautiful. Thank you for noticing. And then (laughs) there's red flags right at the gate. For example, they went out on a date. He had to get some gas. When it was time to pay, John turned to me and said, I only have 100. Do you have a 10? I was a little startled, but I gave him the money. He never paid me back. In retrospect, I should have paid more attention to that, but I was feeling very much alone. The odd woman out whenever else seemed to have a partner. One thing she really liked about him is, one, his persistence. Two, that he like thought she was so hot. And three, that he did stand up for her. Like They would be out and about and someone would be mean to her and John would like beat their ass. And she was like, that's kind of nice. Okay, but I just want to point out this red flag. As me and Ashley were talking about before the episode, We were like, if someone borrowed $10 from me to drive a car that we were both in, I would never in a million years be like, and they didn't even pay me back. Yeah. However, the red flags get bigger. The red flags get redder, especially the part where he does beat someone's ass. Like, that's not really that good. Okay, but if we even just want to go financially, immediately he's like, I'll put on your concerts. And she's like, have you ever done it before? He's like, no. And then he's like, I think we should have something together. We should buy a house together. Let's buy a ranch. And she's like, okay. And then he goes, actually, I think it would make more sense if I bought the ranch since we already basically live in your house and I want to have a house that feels like my house that you could come visit. And she goes, okay. And then he goes, also, I don't have money for either half. So could you loan me the money and then put it in my name? And she goes, okay. And then he's like, here, you can have my car. Can you imagine being like, I can't believe that I didn't notice he didn't pay me back $10 or that he tricked me into buying him a fucking house. And then he would like all the time pull the it's my house card. He would be like, I hate that paint color. And she'd be like, well, I like it. And he'd be like, well, it's my house. And then she gave him at one point, she asked him to like help her build a studio or something. And she came back and he had spent $2 million moving a literal mountain. He moved it from one side of the hill to the other side of the hill. And then there was mudslides because it was not structurally sound. So that he could add a jacuzzi. (laughs) (laughs) Where did she find this loser, Barbara? I guess in hairdressers.com, but dressers spelled with a Z. (laughs) And then she's like, I haven't done an album in a while. He's like, I'll produce it. And then he gets in the studio and keeps telling her she's doing it wrong and not singing it well enough. And she's like, I don't think he really knew about music. I should have not let him produce it because he didn't know. And it's like, yeah, you should not have let him produce it. So then she's working on Funny Lady, the sequel to Funny Girl, which finally wraps up her contract with Ray, that bitch. She thought it was going to be hack, but she wrote it herself. And she actually, if she does say so, it's pretty good. So then she does like a classical album, which she thinks is going to be really good. But the studio is like, Ew, but she's like, no, literally let me make it. And then it, everyone loved it. Wait, stop. You missed my favorite aside. Oh. So she has this story. She's obsessed with Shakespeare, but she never got to play it. And so she was with her friends. And one of them is Lee Stradsberg, the guy who runs Actor Studio, who at one point told her she was too young to be an actor studio. And she's like, well, what if I just put it on with a friend? I know I'm too old to play Juliet, but I've always wanted to be Juliet. So she does a little monologue reading. She does one scene of Juliet and her nanny or whatever. And she said, decades later, my friend told me, I remember the moment exactly. Lee said, Barbara, you've just done the best Juliet I've ever seen. So what do you want her to do? She's the best that there's ever been. People are always crying at her talent. We can't get into all of it, but the amount of times she's like, I can't go up. I can't go up. And they're like, go up. You got to be the headliner. Frank Sinatra's here, but he can't hold a flame to you. And she's like, and then would you believe it? I actually went out there and the standing ovation was so loud they couldn't even hear me sing. I really did bring the house down. I guess I really was the most famous person there. I guess I really am incredible. (laughs) Anyway, a few months later, they asked me to sing and I said, I can't. I'm not any good. And then it turned out that I was the most famous person that had ever lived. Crazy. She is so talented. But like, man, hearing talented people talk about how talented they are is like really not fun. I just think you can only be surprised by your own talent for the first 30 years. And then you have to lay it to rest. Also, I do think that there just needs to be a different storytelling mechanism here for such a storyteller. It can't just keep over and over and over again being like, I didn't have any faith in myself. But then I went up there and I just gave it all I had. And it turns out I was so great. Like, at some point, she has to learn a lesson. At some point, you have to look back on your life and say, not everything here was important. And that's the difference between a good memoir and a bad memoir. And I will say this runs the risk of being a bad memoir because it's like an encyclopedia. There's a difference between telling a story of a person and just writing a list of everything that's ever happened to you. Also, there's like not really any like true reflection on why did I never, ever, ever think I could do it? 
there's just, I never thought I could. And then I did. And then I never thought I could. And then I did. There's kind of this idea of like, she got so famous so fast that the applause stopped meaning anything. And then she had no way to validate herself. She talks about how Funny Girl sold out every ticket before it even opened in London. And she's like, I would get out on stage and everybody just start applauding. And she goes, when they are applauding over nothing, it makes you think it's worth nothing. And now how am I supposed to know if I'm great or not? And she's like, so sometimes the reviews really were like, no, you're, you're so great. And sometimes nobody had to know. And sometimes Lee Strasberg said you're the greatest Juliet there's ever been. And then sometimes people said you're the greatest vocalist of all your time. And sometimes I was winning 100 Grammys. But what else? What would validate her? Like finding what validates you. Because it seems like nothing, but also everything. Do you it's know what I mean? It's just hard. We're 430 pages in and we're not even halfway done. So then one day, John digs through her script pile and is like, why don't you make this script? It was called Not A Star Is Born. And she's like, well, because I read that script and it was just a remake of A Star Is Born. And he's so stupid. He's like, I've never heard of that. He's like, what is that? A movie? And she's like, yeah, like a really good movie. And he was like, oh, well, why don't you just make it anyway? And so she's like, no. And he's like, yes, I want to produce it with you, except for I'm the sole producer and you just are there. And she's like, well, I guess I could help you because you're a novice, but you don't have any experience. And he's like, yeah, but don't take credit. This is annoying to me only because... Only because she said she would never lower herself for any man. And on the very page previous, she talks about feminism and it's the 70s and there's all these movements going on. And she says, it's funny. I really thought about a woman's movement when I was first moving forward as a woman. Was I paid less than a male performer? I don't think so. When I started making records, I couldn't even tell you what I got paid. I didn't care about the money. I just wanted to have creative control. I was treated very well, but women in general were not so lucky. They were fighting for recognition, opportunity, equal pay for equal work. Here was a chance to do a musical that could have a profound love story and try to send a subtle message at the same time. I'm all for women and women's rights, but people will just tune you out if you're too abrasive. I don't understand why feminists are burning their bras. What did bras have to do with it? Maybe it was a symbol of constriction? Like, literally, yeah. Literally, it was a symbol of constriction. Also, I'm sorry that you find that form of protest abrasive. Some people find you abrasive. I hardly ever wore a bra anyway. Now I understand it's in the context of revolution. Sometimes you have to go to extremes in order to come back to the middle and a more balanced place. I'm sorry, but burning a bra is hardly extreme. So that's her statement against radical feminism, burning bras, don't be so abrasive. Anyway, here's a woman who like will walk up to you at a party and tell you that you look like shit. The day she met her husband, she goes, what's wrong with your hair? That was the first thing she ever said to him in his life. And here's someone saying it's too abrasive for women to want equal rights or whatever. And then on the very next page, she's like, anyway, even though he was a novice with no experience, he didn't want to share the producer credit with me. That should have set off alarm bells, but I could see how desperately he wanted that stature. And I knew it would bring him more respect on set. So I thought, okay, let him have it. I'll be executive producer. There's like six more things in this movie specifically where she feels she's not getting respect because she's a woman. She thinks the director doesn't understand her because she's a woman. And I'm like, interesting. I guess those bra burners weren't so stupid. Yeah. So she learns how to play guitar and she writes the song Evergreen for the movie. This is so funny. She cuts out that scene with the guitars. They just say, and she goes, sometimes you have to kill your darlings. Now writing this book and looking at the film again after all these years, I'm not sure I was right. And I just noticed I played a very interesting chord on the guitar that I had forgotten to use in the record. Let me tell you something. This book is not the place to make arguments that things were cut too short. (laughs) She gets pissed because her son, Jason, is like, my dad says you work too much. And she's like, how fucking dare he talk shit about me in front of my son? I agree. No, I think it's so fucked up. But like, I think it's really interesting that it's in this chapter where she's like, feminists are abrasive. Anyway. (laughs) She does all the editing at her own house and she has like multiple teams and she has them going She has a shift from 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. and then people come in at 8 and work till 3. Two women editors were part of the team, but I noticed that the guys were reluctant to let the girls do anything substantial. Women were fine to carry the film cans or change the reel, but other than that, the men were very territorial. Still, I could see that the women were equally competent when I gave them a sequence to cut. And when the house was threatened by a fire at one point, it was a woman whose first thought was to save the film. I guess, do those women need a fucking feminist in their life? I don't know. Yeah. You were the executive producer. Why didn't you say something? Why didn't you say, let them have a turn? Let the girls have a turn. So then Frank, the guy who was directing the movie who sucked, wrote this like horrible article about how Barbara Streisand sucks and Chris Christopherson, who was the man in the movie, was an alcoholic and the whole production sucks ass. And she was like, what the fuck is this? I am like, what the fuck is this? And then he told her he wasn't going to actually send it to the press. He's like, I was not shopping that article around to print. I was shopping that article around for looksies. He's like, I just wanted to like write it out and see how I felt. And then of course he does shop it around, which is shitty. Which is so shitty. The movie still performs really well, but like a lot of the reviews are very colored by this article where everyone says, oh, from the article, we know the production was a nightmare. So this movie kind of sucks. And she's like, I wish they had just seen it. I can't believe he tanked his own movie. And I am like, I can't believe he tanked his own movie. But like... Here's a problem that I have is that now that she keeps on assuming these like producing roles where she works on the script and hires the director and then has these like insane clashes with these directors 
why were these the directors then? Like, what is her searching for a director process? Because this is like the third director that she hires for a movie that she's making that she has like these insane fallouts with. And I'm not saying it's her fault, but I am like, what is her process? No, people were awful. And I do think she does need to be the director. She needs to be like in complete control all the time. Because she is hard to work with. Yeah, she has a vision. And I honestly, I trust her vision. Me too. I mean, when she talks about certain things, she like talks about the way she wanted the movie for A Star is Born to be lit. And I'm like, oh, genius. The way you visualize things and then make them come into life is incredible. And so you should be directing. Then she talks about an article she does. Warren Beatty calls her up and is like, we slept together. And she's like, Ugh, did I? She's like, I literally don't even know. And then she does Playboy, like an interview where she's able to set the record straight about a bunch of things. She does another couple albums. So John keeps trying to marry her and she keeps on being like, I don't really know if I want to, but really she just like doesn't like him at all. It's so funny. She says he tends to ignore inconvenient facts and his version of reality was often very different than mine. He always says we had this great love affair. I remember going skiing in Aspen early on with some friends, their kids and our kids. John and I were arguing continually and he said, aren't we having a great time? I said, John, we're fighting every day. This is not my definition of a great time. And then of course he got sick as usual and wanted to go home. This happened on so many vacations. He wasn't at ease outside his familiar territory. So then she meets a guy who lives in New York and she tells John, who keeps trying to marry her, I am going to go to New York for the weekend and see things through with this man that I want to explore. And he's like, okay. And so then she goes to New York with this other guy and she doesn't have that good of a time with him. So she calls John and is like, come pick me up. That's kind of crazy. And then she's like, and then John was so mean to me. I was like petrified of his temper. She does a song with Donna Summers and they both go to hold a long note for 17 seconds. And Donna tries to hold it and she passes out. She was lying on the floor. She had fallen off her stool. I gasped and said, Donna, are you all right? By this time, everyone's gathered around her and she was sitting up and waving them away saying she was fine. And then she turned to me and explained, I didn't breathe right. I guess I just ran out of air and passed out. But Barbara, when I came to, I couldn't believe it. You were still holding that note. And she started to laugh and so did I. She's very good, that Barbara. And then she does something called Guilty with David Foster. But the whole time she's been working on this movie called Yentl. A movie about a little girl who just wants to study in the yeshiva, but it's only for boys and all she wants is knowledge, but they like won't let her learn. And so she dresses up as a boy. It's like she's the man, but for Torah study. Yeah, this happens and that happens. And for a million reasons, it can't get made for nine years. And finally, it can get made. And she's the director and she's working on the script. And she fights with the guy who originally made the short story because he doesn't like her script and she didn't like his script. And then he died. So that's good. Thank God. I have to say throughout this book, in addition to giving you every explanation of like, I went and met this director. Here's why that didn't work out. I wanted to do it in red. Here's why that worked out. She's also like, and then I met this person who was their hairdresser and we had six great memories. And all six of these memories are this one and this one and this one. And in one of them, we were on an airplane and she made these brownies that were so good. And I ate all the brownies, but she claims I didn't. But to this day, the honest truth is I ate the brownies. So then they add some music to Yentl and then they get to work on it. She goes location scouting. The problem is that her leading man sucks and she has to direct him and make him a better actor. Nobody's as good as her. He's not giving it his all. And then later he said, I was just scared. And she said, oh, that makes sense because I'm scared too. And that's why I act the way I act. I'm like, what does scared mean? That's Mandy Patinkin who grew into a fine actor, some might say. It's funny. She was supposed to have sex with him at the end. There's supposed to be this sex scene and she cuts it because she was so mad at Mandy Patinkin. Yeah, that she's like, I literally like couldn't touch him. She has a really hard time making Yentl because like no one wants to make it, even though she's going to produce it. She's going to direct it. It's all ready to go. No one thinks it's worth any money. And she's like, if I was such a bankable star, why wouldn't anyone bank on me? And she always wants to make these like kind of fringe projects that no one wants to work on. Also, she almost had a deal show up and then John tanked it on purpose because he wanted her to use his friend. And then his friend didn't even pick it up. Dude, John sucks. Here she goes, this is 100 pages on Yentl, and it's like, here's why I picked this scene, and here's where I went location scouting. And also, while I was location scouting, I didn't pick this location, but I did go antiquing, and I saw this table, and I didn't buy it, but I still think about it. So every thought, every morsel of food. Also, she goes to Europe to film Yentl, and she and John are, like, fighting a ton, and she's like, I don't think you should come. And he's like, well, I'm going to probably date someone else while you're gone. And she's like, okay. And they just never really get back together. The press kept harping on the fact that I was the first woman to produce, direct, write, and star in a movie. When you list everything like that, it sounds like a lot, and I didn't want people to hate me for it. That is very sad to me that she was, like, so accustomed to people coming for her that she was like, don't tell everyone how much work I did. I guess here's the thing is when you say she's so accustomed to everyone, she is very neurotic. She has a ton of psychosomatic illnesses. She's always making herself sick. She had been told that everything was going to kill her. She had been told growing up that holding hands with a man would give you a disease, and it took her, like, years to even overcome that. 
She claims she gave herself allergies because she had a bad experience on a horse once. So now she can't go outside. No, she already had horse allergies. And then she started to like horses. So her allergies got better. But then she fell off a horse and her allergies came back. But it's always something like, you know what I mean? It's all stuff like this. So when she's talking about how everybody hates her and everybody's coming for her, I am like, how much of that is just being a person in the press? How much of that is being a woman in the press? And then how much of that is just feeling like everybody's out to get you all the time? Good questions. Do you know what I mean? Like, was it more her than anybody else? I don't know. I mean, it does seem like with Frank writing that article about what a bitch she is, that was shitty. Like, it seems like there were a handful of articles that would go around about, like, how hard she was to work with. But look at what happened to Britney Spears. And that book was only 220 pages. Oh, there's no reason this book should be this long. (laughs) But I do think, like, every celebrity has that to some extent. Yeah. And at some point, you just have to, like, live. I also think that she has a reputation for being quite self-centered, which she obviously is because she wrote a thousand pages about herself. The lesson in every chapter is like, I actually was the best. I actually was the smartest. I actually did a really good job. All of the mistakes were because I didn't say what I wanted to do. And like, if they had done it my way, it would have been good. Yes. So I guess I do believe that she is a pretty self-absorbed person. And I wonder like how many people she has kind of been shitty to without realizing it because they weren't an important person on set. Well, she also says she has this ability to just cut somebody out the minute you make her mad. Like, what about those female editors in the editing room who she, like, never spoke to but just noticed weren't getting their due? Somebody wrote a review that said, I liked it, but I didn't love it. She goes, this was just somebody's girlfriend. So what does she even know? Yes. And I'm like, that's so true. Tear that woman down because that woman wasn't supportive enough of another woman. Also, a really big problem that she has is Steven Spielberg had come to see it and he, like, did an interview with a newspaper. And he was like, it was so great. I think he said, like, I told her, make no edits. And in the article, they said he gave her notes about edits. And she's like, fuck, now everyone's going to think Steven Spielberg made this movie for me. One of the original writers was like, I didn't see it being a musical because she had done musical voiceovers. And she's like, well, Pygmalion wasn't a musical, but look at My Fair Lady. And it's just like, lady, people are allowed to just like see things differently than you. In every chapter, she quotes like 100 good reviews. So don't worry. Some people said, to put it succinctly and at once, Barbara Streisand's Yentl is a triumph, a personal triumph. She's elicited outstanding performances. She has a fascinating, loving portrait. I don't know. Enough people liked it that it just feels like if somebody said the yarmulkes look designer, you could let it go. Yeah. So then she gets nominated for Best Director at the Golden Globes and like a bunch of other Golden Globes. And she wins the Best Director at the Golden Globes, but she does not even get nominated for a Director's Guild Award or an Oscar. And she feels slighted. And this is what I meant earlier when I said she refuses to play the game, but she still wants to win the game. Mm -hmm. I do feel that she like kind of operates outside of the norms of Hollywood, which is fine. Like, I think that that is an okay thing to do. Like, if you don't want to rub shoulders and kiss asses of the elites, literally just don't. But then you can't be like, why don't they want to kiss my ass? But people do acknowledge that she should have been nominated. And she's like, that's awesome. People were really mad at her, though, because the paparazzi would follow her around. And everyone's like, oh, my God, what a diva. Then she started dating this guy named Richard Baskin, and he was like a good boyfriend, but it just didn't work out between them for like an insane reason. Oh my God. But because of that movie, she gets to go speak to a group of women in Hollywood, like women directors. As I was planning my speech, I realized that that wasn't what I wanted to focus on. That being like the problem of patriarchy and the problem with women not ever being nominated for best director. I didn't want to just rail against the male dominated power structure in Hollywood. Instead, I wanted to talk about an even more sensitive subject women against women. I was still shocked that the harshest, most vitriolic, and most personal comments about the movie were made by women reviewers. Why do we as women feel the need to compete with each other? Why are we so quick to tear each other down? Why are we so afraid of each other's success? I don't know, man. Yeah. The thing that are holding women down is other women. If women stop being so mean to each other, one of them would be allowed to be director of the year. That's totally true. The men are waiting for the women to get their act together before they show us any respect. And we won't get it if we don't act good. Ladies, act good. Ladies, act nice. Please be nice. Be nice. Show them that we're good. Girls, we have to deserve what the men so kindly give us. We have to come together as a team and make sure every single girl is in her place. If all the girls don't finish our dinners, the men can't give us dessert. (laughs) And then no one gets an Oscar. Anyway, so the reason things don't work out with Richard is because one morning when she's working on a movie called Nuts, she like wakes up from her sleep and she goes, I've got the shot. Richard reached for a cigarette and turned to me in bed and said, hello, good morning. That was the moment I knew our relationship wasn't going to last. I felt that he didn't understand my creative process and I was hurt. Oh, sorry. He turned to her annoyed and said, hello, good morning. Richard, if you were making a movie and you woke up with an idea, I'd say, let me get a pencil and paper and write it down for you before you forget it. So that was the beginning of the end. 
sometimes I'm like, why can people not understand the genius of Barbara Streisand? And sometimes she's like, you can't date me if you're not like anticipating what things I say that you should write down. But you could date me if you want to produce my album with no experience and then come to the studio and say I'm not doing a good job. That's fine. But if you are not a human notepad, you don't get me. Anyway, so then Chernobyl happens. She like freaks out. She's like, this is the most insane thing that's ever happened. How can we do this to our environment? We are all connected. She says, we all share this one planet. And suddenly I was reminded how fragile it was. And so that's when she agrees to sing live again because she's like, literally the only way that we can elect Democrats who will save the environment is if I sing. So she does like a charity concert. They raise $1.5 million and five out of the six candidates that they were endorsing won. And it turned the Senate over to the Democrats for the first time since 1980. And it helped change the direction of this country. Thank God things are fine now. Her and Alec Baldwin, if we could just let them be P and VP, the world would be a better place. And I've always said that. I always said it should be Alec and Barbara on the ticket. So then she starts working on this movie called The Normal Heart, which is about AIDS. Oh my God, this is the most insane chapter in the book. It is 70 pages about a movie she did not make. It's a brilliant play that was written by her friend who was gay. It doesn't sound like they were friends. Well, her acquaintance. She loved the play. She thought it was a brilliant work. And then she wanted to adapt it into a movie, but he kept making the movie script be bad. So first, she was going to direct it. We both felt that it was actually good for the movie to have a director who was a heterosexual. I've always said that no story about gay people should be told without a straight (laughs) person's perspective. They just can't think the way we think. They don't know what's going on in our little kooky heads. There's no exposure to the straight lifestyles. And if you're going to make a movie about gay people, it should be palatable first and foremost to the straights. So he kept on rewriting it and she kept on being like, why would a straight person watch this? There's too much gay sex. (laughs) Much like with the feminists who are abrasive, she's like, the thing about getting people to like you is you try to be less gay. And she goes, listen, I love the gays, but would I want to see two men kiss? No, never. Anyway, she cannot believe that this guy does not want to work with her and is being difficult. I wanted it to be a love story, not a sex story. And he kept saying, you don't get it. Gays have sex. And she kept saying, but what if in this play they didn't? (laughs) I kept giving him notes on how to make it better and less sexual. She's like, I thought it'd be really cool if throughout the movie you couldn't really tell who was gay and who was straight. And that would kind of get to the root of the thing that we're all just people. And he kept being like, yeah, but it's about gay sex. She said, what if it was people's stories, not a gay story? And she's just like, I cannot believe he was being so difficult. And he kept saying we couldn't work together anymore. And then we would work together. And then he would say no. And I would just beg him, let me tell this story. And she's like, anyway, also, he himself was dying of AIDS. So I get that he had some urgency, but I was busy. And I also thought it should be less gay. Larry was lashing out. He seemed to forget that I, too, spent years of my life trying to get this movie made without a cent of compensation. Can you imagine like having your life's work? You're dying and you're trying to get this movie made. And she's like, uh, I'm dying too I'm to dying. get a project off the ground. <laughs> Long story short, it didn't get made because he wanted a million dollars for the screenplay and she was like, nobody's ever given anyone that much money before. And then Ryan Murphy just bought him out basically and was yeah. like, I'll give it to you. And then Ryan Murphy produced it for HBO and she was like, what the fuck? And, well, then, okay. And then she's like, well, at least I didn't get all my cast. They were missing somebody, Bradley Cooper or something. But then she goes, by the time it got made anyway, all the things they wanted, they had. So it was kind of a little late to the game. She's like, it wasn't very poignant now that they could marry. She goes, if we had done it when I wanted to do it the way I wanted to do it, they would have gotten the right to marry sooner. And now gay people already could get married. So this movie was basically just like, okay, congrats, you're gay. (laughs) (laughs) So then she made a movie called Nuts. I honestly don't know a single thing about it. This is when she plays a girl named Claudia and she's on trial and she murdered a man and they think she's nuts. But you know who's actually nuts? Us. Remember that song that you used to sing? <laughs> I'm a little coconut. I'll sing it. I'm a little coconut sitting in a cocoa rut. I asked myself out on a date. Meet me here at half past eight. I'm a nut. I'm a nut. I'm, I'm crazy. crazy. <laughs> I didn't write that song, but I related to it. I know. <laughs> oh, this movie like helped her sort of realize her relationship with her stepfather and how she wanted his approval, but then she actually doesn't need it. Also that we're the crazy ones. Society. Oh, they wrote this movie in like a week and a half, I think. Also, the director was really mean to her and he was only nice to the boys. And so one time, like Richard, her co-star, was like, I would like to try something with this scene. And the director was like, love to see it. Action. And then Barbara goes, and now I would like to try something with this scene. And he goes, no. And it was like the most humiliating moment of her life. Except for when she forgot the lyrics to that song in Central Park. Marty never quite understood this film. 
He had been handed a finished script and he would carry it around on set, but I had helped write that script. I knew every scene and why it was there. After Marty completed his cut, I watched it and I knew that it wasn't the film in my head. Warner Brothers didn't like it either. So she like re-edits it. And then she is nominated for a Golden Globe for Best Film, Best Actress, and Best Supporting Actor. So I guess somebody else thought it was good. Yeah. Then she dates Don Johnson and she's like, he was awesome because he was so hot and I love hot guys. It didn't work out, but she has no regrets. And now 30 years later, I'll sometimes run into Don at a party given by mutual friends. We hug and he always whispers in my ear, I love you. I don't say it back. Add him to the list of bitches who wishes. (laughs) I wonder if we hadn't been here like 19 hours in the studio. You'd still find that funny, but I'll take it. You guys <laughs> tweeted us if you found that funny. Hashtag, I really liked that bitches who wishes thing. Really nice crack, Claire. So then there's this movie called The Prince of Tides, and it's like an awesome book. I couldn't put down The Prince of Tides. As soon as I finished all 567 pages, I was excited that I went back to the beginning and started again. I guess that's why she has no understanding of page count. I can't believe she read 567 pages and was like, more. Can I just sum it up? She's the star and the director and she produces it and nobody's good and she has to push them to be better and she gets all the shots she wants, but like it's difficult and nobody understands her. And Nick Nolte was in love with her. He told her later, he said, I fell in love with you during that play. Do you know who plays the prince who like knocks it out of the fucking park? The prince of the tides? Uh Her son. Oh yeah. They like tried everybody, but the only person good enough was her son. And then the only person that wasn't her son fell in love with her. Yeah. Also, people really did not respect her on this set. Like one time she was like, can we do the shot one more time? And they were like, no, it's the end of the day. And she was like, how fucking dare you guys have an end of the day? And then it got bad reviews from psychologists were like, that's not how a psychologist would act. And she's like, you don't fucking know anything. (laughs) Analyze this bitch. Oh, and this is when she meets Princess Diana, who says, you stand up first. You're the star. And then she goes, do you know how wonderful you are? So then the Prince of Tides comes out. It got seven nominations. She still does not get nominated for Best Director. And she's like, what the fuck is up with these directors who hate my ass? A woman did not win Best Director for an Oscar until 2010 when I presented the award to Catherine Bigelow for her film The Hurt Locker. So she's like, why is everyone always overlooking women? Also, I wish it was me. That sucks. She also says, for years, I felt guilty about my success. I didn't want people to envy me. Maybe that's why I would get sick to my stomach, but I'm tired of attacking myself. Then she makes more albums. She did one called Just for the Record, which was supposed to be like an autobiography where she does all of her own music. It kind of goes good, but it makes a ton of money, so it's fine. She goes back to Broadway was my milestone in my career. My 50th album for Columbia, the first to debut at number one on the charts, and it was released June 1993. Also, they thought it would be bad. They're like, no one wants Broadway songs anymore, but she was like, no, they do. So she makes it, and then it's good, and she's like, see, bitch. And then she gets really into politics. She like starts getting really involved with politicians. She gets invited to the White House. Bill Clinton is like her best friend. She gives him notes. So like as a director, here's why nobody accepted your apology. Here's what to do. She's like campaigning for him. Yeah, she's like, it actually is so crazy that people cared about whether or not he's faithful to Hillary Clinton. You guys are such fucking losers. The only reason they thought she shouldn't have fucked his intern is because they like are jealous of how good he is at politics. Yeah, she's like, he's the best president in the world. She's like, hey, I want you to win so bad. I'll even sing at your inauguration. Then she's like, oh, can you believe he held me to it? I had to go sing at the inauguration. That is so crazy that you think that that's like a gift you gave. And then she meets Virginia Clinton, who's like a better mom to her than her own mom. She loves Al Gore. She does four pages about Jefferson, just Thomas Jefferson and how smart he was in all of his hobbies. Again, I don't want to knock a woman who's proud of her true like talents and accomplishments. But so she loves him so much. She goes... There was a joke currently making the rounds. The Pope and President Clinton were having a meeting in a robot in the middle of the lake for security reasons. A gust of wind came along and blew the Pope's hat off. Clinton said, no problem, I'll take care of it, and climbed out of the boat, walked across the water, and retrieved the hat. Next day, the headline in the paper was not Clinton walked on water, but Clinton can't swim. She relates to this. I felt a certain kinship with him. Around the same time, someone told me a joke that was going around about me. This is not a joke that was going around about her. A man was choking to death in a restaurant and Barbara Streisand was sitting next to him at the table. She rushed over into the Heimlich maneuver and saved his life. Next day, the headline read, Barbara Streisand takes the food right out of a person's mouth. You can't win. You can't win with these bitches. Anyway, so she wins a Lifetime Achievement Award at the Grammys and she decides to sing a few bars. And then she's like, wait a second, maybe I will sing again because she realized after Chernobyl that her voice carries power. She could raise money for charities. So MGM is like, come to a concert, we'll pay you a fuck ton of money, and we'll give $3 million to charity of your choice. And she was like, oh, how could I say no to that? I love charity. 
And so she does more concerts. She ends up going on a tour and donating like tons of money to charity and raising money for all of these things. So this concert was like the biggest concert of her life, according to her, because she had so much nerves. And she said her mom didn't go to that performance either, that she flew out her mom and two of her friends to see both nights and put them up at the hotel. And then right before the concert, she said, I'm going out on the town. I don't want to watch that girl, which is like, that's really mean. Her friends were like, it's New Year's Eve. We don't want to watch Barbra Streisand. We want to party. They were like 100 years old. They needed her to mom sit like, down. had a full-time aide. She's like, I get that I'm a perfectionist. But she says, you know what? I know how imperfect I am. And I've spent my whole life trying to be a better person, a more loving wife, mother, friend. I'd also like to be a better actress, director, and musician. But I can't make all the films I want to make or hit every note with the purest tone or even build a house without a mistake. It's impossible. I think the journey for me is to really accept that nothing is ever going to be perfect. Also, she figures out that her mom doesn't like her because her mom is jealous of her. I think that's why I'm so sensitive to any hint of jealousy even now. I don't want anyone to be envious of me. It really damages relationships. It's isolating and I don't like that feeling. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah, she has a whole chapter about Virginia Clinton, who was nice. Some guy named Charles. Is this about fucking... I think that's Prince Charles. I'm not talking about him. (laughs) I just want to be free from this book. I feel insane. Okay, we're going to power through it because nothing really happens. So she starts doing a lot of political work. She like does this speech about the artist as a citizen. Can I say something? She quotes somebody and I don't like it. What does she quote? She's talking about how Clinton needs to listen to the people more because Clinton got a Republican consultant. And she's like, how could you have somebody consulting you who's a Republican? Where's his moral clarity? And Shimon Peres says, a leader is like a bus driver. He must never turn around and look back at the passengers. It makes them nervous. They want him to keep his eyes straight on the road ahead. In other words, do what you believe is right and don't pay too much attention to the polls. I don't know, man. I think we've gone too far with that. I think maybe politicians should represent the people who've elected them. I agree. The stupidest line in this whole book is about how she like cares a lot about the environment. And she goes, I never understood the fast buck mentality. Do the oil and gas industries care about the survival of the planet? No. Of course they don't, Barbara, you fucking idiot. She's like, why is everyone just trying to make a quick dollar? Why aren't we trying to protect the world? Oh my God, why don't we just hold hands and sing, you bitch? She gave a speech at Harvard. After her speech, they said, would you please consider running for public office in 1996? The audience applauded, but I said, oh, no, 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 no. I'm passionate about certain issues, but I think I can be much more effective doing what I do. She says, making movies is the way I want to reach people. Everyone was like, Barbara, you're the love of my life. You're my president. You're my everything. But she said, oh, no, 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 no. I have a very important message, which is that, did you know uggo bitches can sometimes just turn it on a notch? So she makes this movie about an uggo who falls in love. Okay, so here's the premise. With Jeff Bridges, which same. So she is not hot, but they're like, let's just get together and not have sex because then we can get more business done. Then they break up because he falls in love with her hot sister named Claire. Coincidence? I think not. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, what if that's the character I was named after? (laughs) The hot girl in the Uggo movie? May you always be a hot girl in a sea of Uggos, my mom said to me. That was her wish for me. That's why I got into comedy. (laughs) Anyway, it turns out that if you just like feel sexy, you are sexy. And they were like, at first we were going to have her get plastic surgery to prove that anybody could be hot if they just worked hard enough. But then they were like, actually, the message is that if you feel beautiful, you are beautiful. And I think Amy Schumer did an incredible reprise of that idea in the hit film, beloved movie, cult classic, (gasps) Peloton Girl or whatever it was called. (laughs) Remember when I watched that on a plane and I got so mad? I feel pretty. I feel pretty. Okay. (laughs) So then she was like, art imitates life because I hadn't been feeling so pretty. But then I made this movie and I felt really pretty. And then I met James. Brolin. I will say he's hot. He's so hot. So she saw him at a party. Her friend really wanted them to meet. And she walked up to him and she said, what the fuck happened to your hair? He had a buzz cut. And she's like, it looks like shit. And then they fall in love. And then they have a secret wedding. Oh, my God. She does one of the craziest things I've ever heard of a woman doing. And she is in her full on 50s at this point. So they're early on in their dating history. So she's talking about how she had to like learn how to be in a relationship. They're early on dating. And she was excited to show him off to her friends. So she invites her two best friends to the Met Opera. They sit two behind her and it's like two and two. So she's in front because she wants them to like watch the opera, but also watch how much she's in love with her. And I guess 20 minutes into the play or the opera, he hasn't put his arm around her yet. And she's like really pissed that he's not being demonstrative. She says in an aside that it turns out he's not like a physically demonstrative person in public. He doesn't do PDA. But she's so mad that he hasn't put his arm around her. And what she thought was the only way to prove to her friends that she finally was in a loving relationship that she got up to go to the bathroom to like stew and steam. 
And then the ushers wouldn't let her back in because you're not allowed to like leave the theater and then come back. And she made her even more mad. So she just went home. Can you imagine turning to your right? Your girlfriend's gone. Three hours later, she's nowhere to be found. And then she's like, well, you didn't hug me. I thought you would have hugged me. Crazy stuff. You didn't even mention that she dated Andre Agassi. He didn't get that much time in her memoir, but she got a lot in his. Oh, yeah. She mentions Andre Agassi. She says that she actually felt very passionate towards Andre Agassi. One of the like top two or three most passionate loves. They just got each other, man. She can connect to anybody with a bad dad story. And it turns out that's 29% of America. Probably more. 42% of America. Oh, can I say something about Jim? One time he looked over her and said, I don't want to go to sleep. And she said, why not? And he said, because I'll miss you. And I was like, well, I've heard that fucking thing before, that rip off. And then you know what it actually turns out? That they wrote the song. Don't want to close my eyes. Don't want to fall asleep because I'll miss you. Babe. They based it on his lyrics because Barbara told it to somebody in an interview. And then somebody heard him in the interview. And they were like, that is so beautiful. And they wrote it. And Aerosmith sold millions of copies of his romantic gesture. That's actually cool. Max never said anything to me that was so romantic that I said it on TV and then it turned into a song. <laughs> Sometimes I wonder if I should leave him at the opera. <laughs> How often does he write your ideas down in the morning? <laughs> Never. Mac, count your fucking days. <laughs> did you know Donna Karen is her best friend? I did, actually. Okay, well, she made her a custom wedding dress, and would you believe it? Barbara's like, this looks like ass. And then Donna was like, give it a minute, and it turned out it was really beautiful. So score one for somebody else. And then you know what else Barbara got really into? What? Day trading. She did it for two years where she'd wake up at 6 a.m. and day trade. And even Donna Karen was like, well, take a million of my dollars. And she's like, I don't want a million of your dollars. And she's like, please. She's like, I'm too scared to lose your dollars. She goes, well, whatever money I make, we'll just go on a boat vacation. She says boat. I know what she means. And then you know what? By the end of eight months, she had turned Donna Karen's 1 million into 1.8. So I guess they went on a pretty fab boat vacation. Yeah, I guess maybe instead of taking just a boat, they went on one of those Leonardo DiCaprio boats. So then she's like, you guys are such fucking loser narcs for thinking that Bill Clinton shouldn't cheat on his wife. And then she says Al Gore should have won and then we wouldn't have had the Iraq war. Also, we wouldn't have a climate crisis and you guys are idiots for that one. Oh, and then she addresses the Streisand effect. And she's like, I wasn't trying to get a picture of my house off the internet because I'm a bitch. I was trying to get a house off the internet because I didn't want people to know where I lived for safety reasons. And I am like, that is reasonable. It's reasonable, but I also think it returns to like our point of people's criticisms of her aren't untrue. The statement isn't wrong. The bias is wrong. Yeah. Yeah. It's not fucked up of her to want to get her address off the internet, but the Streisand effect refers to the fact that the more you try to get something off the internet, the bigger of a deal it becomes on the internet. Right. Like, I do think it's just like the fact of the way the internet works that like we don't have privacy anymore and that everything lives forever on the internet. So for her to be like, you don't understand, I had a good reason. Like, nobody's saying you had a good or bad reason. Just the truth is. She also had actually this line that I thought was one of the more unhinged things I've read. And that's on page 880. So you can understand why I was a little bit fed up with her. She marries this man and at her home in secret because she doesn't want anyone to know, blah, blah, blah. She has like six paragraphs about what kind of dessert they're going to have. And they finally ultimately decide to have all the desserts. Why, Barbara, not just have a sentence that said we had every dessert we could think of. You don't have to like walk us through the hemming and hawing of ultimately deciding everything. The guest list was deliberately small, only our closest friends and family. And it was important to me that each couple we invited was happily married because that was the kind of energy I wanted to surround us on our day. I can't believe I wouldn't have been invited to your wedding if you were Barbara. But isn't that kind of fucked up? It's not people's fault if they have a bad marriage or if they're single. Yeah, I They don't I love agree. you. Like, I think that's fucked up. It's also to be like, you have bad energy for my wedding if you're not like in love. Also, I would love to hear about like who made the judgment about what was a happily married couple and what was an unhappily married couple who couldn't be invited. Because I have some friends and couples where I'd be like, it's a happily married rule. So, <laughs> okay. I love this sentence. For me, 1998 will always be the year Jim and I got married, but it was also the year that I was shocked to see how far the right wing would go to try to take down President Clinton, who threatened their grip on power because he was doing his job so well. She also was trying to make a movie called Gypsy that she didn't get. And so she's like, dude, that year was crazy. And then, oh, wait, that happened in 2001 after 9-11. Sorry. Yeah. But guess what? What? She was able to sing a song for 9-11. So in a way, she saved it. That's so nice. She found out women die from heart disease more than men. And she was like, we have to stop that. Oh, she did stop that. <laughs> uh, she goes to Europe like every year. And every time she goes, she has to tell you about the museum she saw. We know you're always going to the same ones. She loves Egon Schiele. 
she like goes on tour with her son and she's like, but he wasn't just using me. He really was that good. And then she also is like, and I let my sister come. She's kind of like me and that she likes to perform. I was like, oof, zing, zang, zong. Yeah. Because at one point she visited Trudeau and she's like, well, my sister was singing in Vancouver. And I'm like, oof, your sister's Barbara Streisand, Sand, and you're in Vancouver. And then for her to be like, she's like me in that she likes to be on stage. I'm like, oof. So then Trump gets elected and she's like, what the fuck? This is like the stupidest thing that's ever happened. And I agree. She couldn't get Gypsy off the ground. And Trump won. And I just get it that a lot of people think, oh, if you are struggling, if you are lower income, if you are part of one of the minority groups that he specifically went after with his rhetoric, you might have had it a hard time. But you didn't even have a project that you were trying to get off the ground. So in a way, she had more to lose and she lost it all. And then her dog died. I swear to fucking God, if your citizenship was revoked from this country, but you have a project that you did get off the ground. When the Dreamer Act was up for grabs. If you did a vlog that day, then you had a better time. (laughs) Then she clones her dog. She didn't know if it would work. So she just like got a new dog. But then they cloned her dog twice. So then she had three dogs, two clones, one regular. She says, thank God for the younger generation who are gender blind and colorblind and who care deeply about the environment. It's true. It's getting better every day. And the conclusion of this book is nothing is impossible. Looking back, it was more fun to dream of being famous than it was to be famous. But overall, she's had a lot of really amazing experiences and she's excited for the rest of the journey that is her life. So here's to life to dreamers and their dreams. I wish you love and many, many happy days. I think I truly am one of the luckiest people in the world. I guess the thing is at the end, the thing that really started to unravel for me is that there is no thing. Like what happened? It's a great encyclopedia of Barbara Streisand. It's not a great memoir because a memoir needs to have a fucking arc. It's not even a good memoir. I don't know what she learns. I don't know what she discovered. Like, I know what her insecurities are. I know the struggles. I know the pain points. I know, like, the yearning. But, like, what happened next? I understand that life is lived linearly. And the way that you can't just translate a play to film, you can't just translate journal entries to a book. I understand that when you're living through it, all of these things feel like the most important thing. But you can't take 80 years worth of thinking that today is the most important day and then write them all down. You have to pick and choose. There has to be an arc. How fertile would you say this soil is? Okay. It was so fertile, it was manure. (laughs) Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I will say so much happened, but there was no story. And how many worm teenies would you want to have with Barbara Streisand? I do one for the story. Me too. She doesn't drink though. She reminds you of that a lot, especially when she is actually drinking. Well, I love you guys. Who do you love even more?